All right, I've got seven o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody to this special meeting of the Board of Education. This is actually our, uh, our retreat. So I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. And if we could get the flag, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation. I'm mean, God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. All right. So, uh, as this is a special meeting, I'm going to review our uh, our ground rules. Uh, so, this meeting tonight is being conducted pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 7B. Uh, per that order, we're recording the meeting. It'll be posted on our webpage uh, and our YouTube channel. Um, and you can get there by uh, you can get there uh, via our website. Uh, our agenda for tonight's meeting is posted on our board docs website. You can get there by going to greenwichschools.org, clicking on Board of Education, scrolling down, clicking the blue meeting, uh, the blue meetings box. Uh, once you're in board docs, you'll see tonight's meeting and click on there and access the agenda. So this is a special meeting and it's a, uh, it's a uh, retreat, so we won't be taking any public comment tonight. Obviously, members of the community can always send an email to all of the Board of Ed members by sending to a single email address. That is boardofedmembers at greenwich.k12.ct.us. So the meeting tonight is gonna to consist of uh, discussion by and among the superintendent board members, uh, the superintendent's team. Uh, and we've got some external guests from the United Way joining us tonight and uh, we'll be catching up with them later to hear about some interesting things. Uh, I'd ask people to please stay on mute when they're not speaking. Uh, I'd ask that uh, participants state their name each and every time they speak, unless I've called on you by name. Uh, we need to do that for the record. Uh, we'll be using the raise the hand function for board members so I can call on people in turn. I'd ask the board members try to keep their comments concise uh, and any voting will be done uh, by roll call. I'm gonna be, uh, we'll be asking and calling for your name. All right, with that, we're gonna move into our agenda. Uh, the first item of business is a discussion item. It's, it's uh, titled for the good of the order. Uh, under Robert's Rules of Order, the newly revised 11th edition, uh, this is styled as an opportunity for the board to have a discussion about the organization. Uh, with that, Mr. Kelly, I believe you had a, uh, something you wanted to do. Yeah, I wanted to make a, a motion to uh, uh, censure our uh, fellow board member, Mr. Scherr, for his uh, foul language uh, the last meeting. So I'm going to read a, uh, uh, a motion. Uh, let's see. Pursuant to board policy 9222, I am moving that the board censure Peter Scheer for his conduct during the February 19th, 2021, uh, when he was heard using offensive and inappropriate language, uttering disparaging comments about a fellow board member. Censure is warranted as his behavior violates board policy yeah. 271. Uh, he just went right into it. Karen, uh, we can somebody interrupt me. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Kelly, you have the floor. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, censure is warranted as his behavior violates board policy 9271, uh, the code of ethics, uh, especially uh, the provision that board members and superintendents recognize that a clear that clear and appropriate communications are key to the successful operation of the school district. Uh, board members and superintendents will always carry out uh, their respective role with the highest level of professionalism, honesty, integrity. Board members and superintendents both recognize that they serve as part of an educational team with mutual respect, trust, civility, uh, and regards for each other's respective role and responsibilities. Board members and superintendents uh, practice and promote ethical behavior in the boardroom as a model for all district employees. All right, is there a second for that motion? I'll second. All right, motion by Mr. Kelly, second by Ms. Olson. Uh, before we get to discussion, are there any procedural questions or motions that need to be made? Ms. Kowalski. Yeah, I have a, a, a point of order. Uh, so this wasn't noticed. Uh, I'm con I have a question regarding the notice that was provided. In fact, there was no notice. There's no description. 
in the agenda item, it just says for good of the order. And then if you look for the cover sheet, it says on behalf of the board, but there's no purpose for, there's no documents or recommended motions. So I'm wondering how this came to be and why the board was not informed in advance of this meeting of this motion. Ms. Kelly, I understand you had a conversation with Mr. Kelly where he actually notified you that this was coming. So actually, uh, I could I can read the text messages, Peter, that, back and forth. He did not notify. If you like, you can make a motion to postpone this until our March business meeting. That's fine. I'd be happy to entertain such a motion. Well, I, I'm also wondering whether or not we've received a, you know advice of counsel as to the proper process it, uh, related to this. Well, Karen, uh, I'm relying on Robert's rules of order, which is actually what our policies say. So I'm not sure that we absolutely need the advice of counsel on our agenda. We construct our own agendas per our policies. Uh, if you'd like to make a motion at this point, or if somebody else would like to make a motion to postpone this, we can do that. Would you like to make that motion? Sure, I'll, I'll make a motion to, to postpone this because I think that one, it, we've gone outside of the proper procedure. I think we need to consult our town attorney to the extent he hasn't been consulted al already. And unless you've, or unless the town attorney has spoken on this, Peter, can you opine? Has the town attorney you've spoken on You've made a motion, Karen, we're gonna take your motion. Okay, we've made a motion to postpone and that's to the March business meeting, correct? Karen? Yes, postpone it to the, to the March business meeting. Okay, is there a second for that motion? I'll go ahead and second that motion. Discussion. Okay. Ms. Kowalski, go ahead. Sure. So I'd like to know whether or not um, you, anyone on the board, even yourself, Peter, has received correspondence from the town attorney regarding this um, meeting agenda item. Interestingly, Ms. Kowalski, I have received unsolicited correspondence from town council. I will advise you, we do have a board policy about who is supposed to be contacting town council. I'd be happy to share that with the board. Uh, unsolicited- I didn't, I, I didn't contact town council. Yeah, that, that's fine. You may have contacted somebody else. That's fine. Uh, I've heard from town council. We are not in alignment as to whether or not this is the proper uh, order for the motion. I, I, as, to, uh, as to that, it was unsolicited, not requested by us in any size, shape, or, or form. Uh, this is used by other organizations to do this, and it's clearly elucidated in uh, Robert's Rules of Order. But I'm happy to uh, to move this to the March business meeting. I'd much rather be doing the work of the board, but if this is the uh, desire of the group, we'll move this to the March business meeting. So any further discussion? All right, hearing that, we'll take a roll call uh, vote on the motion to postpone to the March business meeting. All right, going down the line, Bernstein is a yes. Uh, Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? I'm sorry, what was the motion to postpone uh, this? To postpone the item until our March business meeting. And you both said yes? I'm just, I'm taking notes, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, Bernstein was a yes, Stowe was a yes. So Hirsch? Um, I'd rather be working on the board materials, but sure, I guess, yes. Downey? Um, I didn't get my hand up fast enough on discussion, but given that we're at the vote, I will vote yes. All right, if you'd like, you can say something after. Mr. Kelly? Oh, hold on, there I am, yes. All right, Ms. Kowalski? Yes. Ms. Olson? Sorry, Megan, you're muted. Oh, me, okay, I, 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 I don't, I don't see the point of postponing, but uh, I guess, I mean, we're just going to be even more public at that point, but uh, yes, I guess. Okay, and Mr. Sher. Um, guys, I, Peter, that's a yeah, we're taking a vote on a motion on the floor. It's yes, no, or abstain. Uh, no. Considering I kind of got blindsided by this, I'd like to take it up now. Well, we're gonna we're gonna take it up at our March meeting. We said motion passed seven to one, and we're just gonna move on with our work. So at this point, uh, I would like to invite our guest from the Greenwich United Way, uh, Mr. David Rabin, and I think Michael, you may need to elevate him.
David, you should be elevated now. How's that? I see two yeah. of the, th there's three of you, I believe, right? That is correct. Jeremy. Uh, I don't see. Should be one more. I didn't see Aaron, like for Jeremy. I don't see, I see David's name twice and I elevated Robert Moore as well. Rob Moore is the third one. I don't see. Let me look for him again. Oh, there he is. Promote. He should be joining us shortly. And there he is. There he is. While he's turning on everything, I just wanted to thank you all for having us on here today. And, and what you're going to hear about is a program we started about four years ago to close the achievement gap among at-risk kids in the town of Greenwich. But before I start, I wanted to let you know that without Tony Jones's support, all along the way, we would not be sharing this, this data and information that we have tonight with you. She has been terrific in getting us the data we need to, to prove this program works. So Tony, thank you for that. Um, about four years ago, as I said, we started a program called ECAGS. You may hear me say that acronym, Early Childhood Achievement Gap Solutions. Uh, that's what it stands for. It's a two-pronged approach to close the achievement gap among at-risk kids, children in town, and we raised three years worth of funding. We are current uh, to, to run the program. We are currently in year three. And we have some pretty good results to, to chat about right now. That I'm gonna try and whip through about a 50 minute presentation in, in under 30 so you all can get back to your agenda. Again, very grateful for the opportunity to, to show you guys what we're up to. So what, when does an achievement gap occur? And I may be preaching to the choir on some of this stuff. So that's another reason I'm gonna talk really fast, but. An achievement gap occurs when, when a group of students outperforms another group and the difference in average scores for the two groups is statistically significant. And that is the case in Greenwich. And ECAGS was designed to narrow that gap. And because no one organization, it's a pretty heavy lift for one organization, we brought together several organizations in town to, to make this happen uh, with us leading the way. And we've made some remarkable, remarkable progress. There's uh, our, our impact partners as you can see there along the way, family centers, uh, DHS, Greenwich Public Schools, uh, Greenwich Alliance for Education, they've all uh, helped us get to where we are today. So the first prong, as I said, remember, it's a two-pronged approach. It's a prenatal to three-year-old uh, segment that's called PAT. PAT is a, is a nationally recognized evidence-based program, in-home visitation program. We call it GPAT, Greenwich Parents as Teachers. Uh, on family centers payroll paid for by us and that monitored by us uh, in this very prescriptive program uh, are two bilingual parent educators that have gone into the homes of 40 individuals, uh, 40 families. Each parent educator is allowed to, uh, the maximum they're allowed to handle are 20 cases. So that's why we're at 40 right now. We also have a wait list of families waiting to get in to that uh, program. Some of the key metrics, as you can see, for GPAT in, in years one and uh, years one and two, uh, the current age of the breakdown of children is there. The total home visitations, you can see. Uh, one of the most important things I want to point out is that children newly identified with potential delays and concerns. This program has identified at least more than that. You see 12 there, but more than that up to now, uh, delays and concerns. And when these, as you know, delays and concerns are identified early. The earlier they can be mitigated, the earlier they can be taken care of before they get to kindergarten when it's a whole new host of issues that, that come into play. So we're really proud of the fact that this program identifies those concerns uh, and, and mitigates them much earlier than, than they would be otherwise. Some of the referred services that these uh, parent educators have sent the parents and the children to, you can see there. Uh, and and the, this program gives these parents one of the big things it does is give these parents, uh, lets them be their own advocate, teaches them how to navigate the social services landscape in town. And this program is free. I want to note, point that out. This program is free for all participants. Uh, it teaches the parents to navigate the, you know, what is a, a difficult landscape to navigate in the town of Greenwich and lets them be their, their own voice. Of course, COVID hit and, you know, things happened with, with that. Um, during the pandemic, the need for home visitation increased, things were delivered, um, the program was delivered uh, virtually for the most part. We're going to get to a video in a little while that, that's going to be kind of compelling. Uh, these 
you know, the program pivoted a little bit to, to do it virtually and with ter tremendous impact nevertheless, because that's the power of this program. Even though it was delivered virtually, uh, the program had a terrific impact, tremendous impact, and we're gonna see that in just a little bit. Uh, so one of the screening tools we use to track outcomes for our parents is a screening tool called Life Skills Progression, which has been approved by PAT. That is an intervention planning instrument uh, to track progress uh, across 43 critical life skills uh, that are centered around healthy relationships, education, mental health, substance abuse, and other risks, basic essentials, and then infant and toddler development. Uh, and if you see the bold below across the program, scores continue to increase or trend in the right direction uh, in nine of the families uh, through two years of pro programming have showed significant improvement, improvement uh, with this parent screening tool. How we track outcomes with children, uh, we use ages and stages questionnaire. Again, that's another PAT uh, approved screening tool. Uh, and you'll see uh, what ASQ uh, screens against those five domains of communication, gross motor, fine motor, problem solving and personal social. Uh, and over half of the families um, or the children that have been screened have shown improvement uh, with this tool. And as David mentioned before, uh, this is a tool that we use to identify any delays or concerns. It also identifies strengths for the children. Uh, and this is where our parent educators uh, who do the direct services, if they notice something or if the family has a concern, can refer them to the Birth to Three program. Some of the GPAD outcomes to date, we're really proud of this. This, this shows partially another slide we're gonna see, but this, this shows our proof of concept is working. Uh, PAT is a 35 year old nationally recognized, you know, evidence-based program. We just didn't pick it out of a hat. It, it, it's been around for a long time with great results. Um, we have been, our program has been recognized as a model of fidelity two years in a row. Some of the participation and supportive services you can see there that we've helped these families quite a bit during the last couple of years with grants, uh, books, uh, other materials. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that none of the children in the program were referred to DCF for abuse or neglect. And 100% of the families per the SAT, parent SAT surveys strongly agree or agree that this program is helping them in many different ways to be the best parent they can be, which then prepares their child uh, for, for school. What we want to show you now is a quick little video uh, of a GPAT, uh, Greenwich Parents as Teachers parent, and her. It's about only three minutes long, but uh, take take a listen. I found out about the program because with the whole COVID thing and being a new mom, um, times were very depressing and like I was sad a lot and like though I have my daughter and it made me very happy, I still had that sad feeling. And so I spoke to my healthcare provider and I said, you know, just I kind I don't really see anyone. I can't talk about anyone with mommy stuff. Like I need someone that is gonna help me work through my like in a way postpartum depression. And that's when she suggested I talk to Jessica. I'm always very, very grateful that parents open their doors to their house and especially uh, the door for their child's life. It's so amazing what they share with me. It motivates me and it makes me want to do more each day. As a first time mom, like there's that first couple months where it's like a big, big change, you know, and like She's helped me overcome that big change. And by that providing, I feel like I'm a better mom to Lila. Before I was like crying all the time. And I would look at Lila and be like, oh, but I should be happy, but I'm not, what's wrong with me? And like Jessica has shown me that there's nothing wrong with me. Like we go through phases in life and especially doing a, being a first time mom and doing this through a pandemic. 
I feel like my depression and like my mood has completely changed because when I have like questions I can talk with her like if I have baby questions she guides me in like what to play with her what books to read she's taught me how to like teach Lila how to like sleep on her own or like how to console her when she's crying and like sometimes I didn't know where the resources were for me to get things for her you know the person that I go to first when I need something that I can't get on my own is Jessica. I'm only here to support them because I know that their voice is as loud as mine so I'm here just on the sidelines because I know that they can you know advocate for themselves and be heard and I want to let them know that they have that ability to do that. I could have not done this on my own um, and I am so grateful, sorry, um, that you know I met Jessica, especially as a single mom, you know, like he's made me realize that in order for me to be a better mom that I also need to take care of myself and like she does also point things out that I can do for me to better my life so I can better Lila's life. important to note, as I mentioned, the power of this program getting delivered virtually for now anyway, um, that baby Lila was born in April. We shot that video uh, film in November. Those, the, the parent educator, Jessica, had never met the mom and the baby in person. The program, as I said, was delivered virtually. That's the first time they met each other in person other than, you know, Jessica dropping off some supplies and stuff at the front door. So the delivery of that program, even though virtual, is extremely powerful. Now, I want to take a little pause here to see if there's any questions from anyone because there's still a couple of years are going to have to pass before these kids get to Tony Jones's group uh, in the kindergarten. And I want to talk about the second prong of the program, but I want to see if there's any questions on, on the GPAT side of it first. Ms. Hirsch, I see your hand. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to Greenwich United Way and to, to you, Mr. Rabin. Um, for sharing this with us, at least the first half so far, um, and for the consistent incred and incredible support you consistently offer to our community. Um, this is such an incredibly wonderful uh, sounding program. And I was just curious, because you said you're, uh, you have a wait list of student of children that want to be participant or parents that want their children to participate in the program. Um, how are parents trained to become, uh, well, I'll go with PATS. <laughs> Um, well, well, parents are not trained. These are these are trained parent educators that have to go through a, a prescriptive training program at the PAT office in, I want to say it's in Canton, Ohio, I think there's one, there's a major training area in the Northeast, I think it's in, it's in Connecticut, I think it's in Canton uh, is the area it's in, but these are these are trained social workers who want to be parent in home parent educators, they go in and they train the trainer, in this case, the trainers, the, the parent, to be the best parent they can be. I, I Does that make sense, Karen? It completely does. I was just trying to see, you know, you know, how many people we have, you know, in town that social workers um, and beyond that might be interested in getting that training. Um, and are there any qualifications needed for families to be able to have their children participate in the program other than uh, coming off the wait list and well, their age? <laughs> yeah, the, the program is for prenatal to three years old. We, we accept children up to six months old. Uh, anytime past that, it's, 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 um, gets a little dicey to accept them into the program. So I'm going to talk a little bit later on at the end about how perhaps we can scale up. But of course, that all depends on one thing, and you know what that is. Uh, <laughs> well, I, there, I know there's an incredible need uh, of support for social, and, you know, social workers and in, 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 for all age groups. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I just yeah. say, thank you. you. And, and just to add, there's income el eligibility as well. So uh, it's roughly uh, the free and reduced price lunch guidelines is what we use for a family of four. Um, and for depending on the number of people in the household, but basically mirrors the free and reduced price lunch thresholds. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and, and just to quickly add, the average household income of a family that's in our program uh, is between thirty and $40,000. Okay. Thank you. Any other Thanks, board members? Sir. You want to raise your hands if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll keep going and we'll have time for questions later. All right, uh, David, Rob, I don't see any other hands right now, so why don't you guys keep going and we'll come back to. Okay, so still a little time left before they get to kindergarten, right? So the second prong of the program, I may refer to her as a PSIC or preschool instructional coach or Sophie because that that's her name. Uh, we hired uh, a, on our payroll as a, is this preschool instructional coach. 
and her name is Sophie. And she came on board in uh, October of 18. Now she was previously a, a NACI accreditor. She went around and accredited preschool. So her background is, is terrific, was perfect. She also utilizes the Jim Knight model, which is the same as uh, Greenwich Public Schools. And she's in the family centers and the uh, preschools where these at-risk children attend. And also she was in the YMCA uh, Magic Rainbow until that, um, that program shut down. Now we worked on uh, ways to develop a consistent way to put input data. That's what her second main goal is. Her, her real main goal, the number one priority is to improve the instruction of the curriculum in these preschools. And that's what she does. She observes, again, the Jim Knight model, if, if you all know what that is, is a, is a terrific model that uh, perfectly blends with what the Greenwich Public Schools is doing. Uh, Tony Jones has allowed her, you know, soft, you know, we'll call it soft dollars to sit in on the, the PD, the professional development to learn more about, you know, the way Greenwich Public Schools does things. And we're gonna talk about that in a little while, uh, some things that she's offered to GPS that they've actually adopted. Uh, but that makes it for a, for a really good uh, transition to kindergarten. You know, simple things like that I've learned, you know, from even like moving a bookcase from one side of the preschool classroom to another or moving a garbage can has a terrific impact on the instruction and learning that goes on in those classrooms. It's, a, it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, some of the key metrics that Sophie has produced so far, you can see the students, number of students served annually, a number of teachers she's, she's helped, a number of preschool classrooms, a number of hours she's put in. Uh, all the kids that have gone from uh, the preschool into the Greenwich Public Schools. And, um, you know, she, she has had a, a, a terrific positive impact on the teaching instruction and the curriculum delivery in these preschools. Uh, what you'll see here, how we track progress uh, while they're in the preschools. Uh, we use something called TSG or Teaching Strategies Gold. It's an assessment tool. Uh, just to see how kids are doing three times a year or three checkpoints uh, in the fall, winter, uh, and spring. If you look at that paragraph above in 2017, 2018, before we inserted Sophie or started doing instructional coaching, family centers reported to us that 45 to 60% of their students were meeting expectations across those eight domains. Uh, but we're going to focus on the six from social emotional to math. Uh, the data gets a little wonky. That's just how the software spits it out for the two Span uh, Spanish domains. Um, you'll notice uh, this is a winter checkpoint of 2020. So she's been in there for about two years and the purple bar uh, that you're looking at across those six domains is meeting expectations. And those have jumped uh, by about 10 to 15% across those six major domains. Uh, so we've noticed that more children are meeting expectations uh, in these family centers preschool settings. Uh, and that shows to show the, uh, the impact that instructional coaching can have on the, uh, the learning environment and building teacher capacity, which is the ultimate goal. So our goal when we started this program four years ago was to narrow the achievement gap among at-risk kids entering kindergarten. This slide, if you didn't pay attention to any of the other ones, this slide shows our proof of concept that it is working after, after two years. The top data set uh, has GPS, FRL. Those are the kids on free and reduced lunch who are not in our program. Those are their scores on the KEI, the kindergarten entrance inventory across those domains. The kids in the, uh, with one year of ECAGs who are on free and reduced lunch in the green line uh, with, one, again, one year show an improvement over the kids who are not in our program who are on in free and reduced lunch. Um, the second data points show kids with two years, because as I said, we're in year three. So these are kids with two years of preschool instructional coaching, entering kindergarten, and the significant, on the scale of one to three, the significant impact or the significant difference uh, in their scoring as they enter kindergarten. And very important to note is the asterisk, that these results are in line with Greenwich Public Schools district average for non-FRL students, which was our goal getting these kids on a level playing field with their non-at-risk peers. And again, thanks to Tony Jones for that data. That, that is the, that, is the uh, that shows proof of concept and, and we're very, very proud of that. So family centers, uh, uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, they're, again, they're our partner. So we had to address things over there. We, we developed uh, lesson plans, changing templates, um, data collection, 
Uh, we piloted things at these sites, the preschool SOFI collects feedback to make appropriate revisions as needed. Again, the, the, the data is the most important thing uh, that we have to show uh, that it is working. And as you can see from that previous slide, it, it certainly, certainly is working. In fact, it's worked so well that Family Centers has asked Sophie, our preschool instructional coach, to expand the services she, she's offering there and she's doing through their Head Start program and also the infant and toddler programs uh, to help families prepare entering preschool. It's, it's just been terrific outcomes for, for this program so far. Uh, as many of you know, the, the YMCA Magic Rainbow closed down. Uh, Sophie, our PSIC, was placed in there. Um, it's not there anymore. We did work really hard, just as a side note, to get a new provider in there. And we did get a new provider in there to, and we're offering scholarships to the children who attend there. The Greenwich Night Away is. Uh, it was, took about eight months or nine months to get a provider in there through all the, all the, into that same site of St. Rock's, if you know where that is, um, all the zoning and health and all the town, the town regulations and things had to be passed. We, we helped them get through that. And they finally opened on January 4th fourth or sixth, and they are taking, uh, taking children in there now, and they will accept our scholarships as well. So I want to see if there's any questions on the, on the preschool instructional coaching side of this uh, two-pronged approach to closing the achievement gap among at-risk children in the town of Greenwich. Mr. Scherer, see your hand. Uh, hi, David. How are you? Hello, Peter. Doing well, thanks. Um, it's nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, could you back up probably, I think it's, I was trying to count so I didn't lose track, five slides? Yep. Or I guess it says it's, it's Jeremy, your partner. Yep. It's Jer Jeremy's running the show, yeah. Hey, Jeremy. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you. Which slide would you like to see? Um, I don't know the title of it. I had like three questions on three slides in a row. So can right now I'm looking at, can you back up five slides? One, two, three, four, one more. Um, so David, just, I wanna be clear, you're doing this at the YMCA and with family centers is really where you've done it. The right? answer to that is, is yes and no. Okay. Yes, the boat, yeah, yes, it was both until the YM closed there for right. Saturday. Right. And are there any other partners you're um, considering? Well, at this time... Or targeting, I should say? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And at this time, Peter, we certainly are thinking of scaling it up, but we're really only in the thinking portion okay. because okay. what I need to see is this. We need to see five years worth of data, right? We need to see the children go through the entire dosage, which is a five-year program. So the three years of GPAT, two years of preschool instructional coaching. Yeah. I wanna see those numbers too, when those kids enter the kindergarten. We have no kids entering kindergarten yet who have gone through three years of GPAT, right? Right, sure. So when I have that data, um, I think it's gonna be a, an absolute grand slam when we see that data and then we can you know, scale it up, move it out to other, other locations, raise funding to do that. Um, it, it's certainly, I'm, I'm, it's never easy to raise money, as you know, but I can tell you this, with this data in hand, uh, we have been, uh, you know, raising, raising funds for years four, five, and six, which is what we're raising funds for now, because I want to be in the same position we were four years ago, three years ago, to focus on the program right. and the outcomes and not have to worry about fundraising. Okay. Can you, um, can we go to the next slide, which was a data slide, I think? Um, could you, I didn't understand the part of assess mastery of common core. I didn't, I, I'm not familiar with common core below kindergarten. So what is this really saying? I mean, it's fascinating to me that you guys are actually aligning to that. Yeah, the, the way the creative curriculum uh, works is that it aligns with the Connecticut ELDS, the Connecticut Early Learning Standards, and mm -hmm. there's some connection to the common core there. Okay. Uh, which is connected to kindergarten readiness. Um, and that's just how a creative curriculum describes its, its curriculum as, as a mastery of common core or, or helps you know, uh, the, yeah. the basics that kids need to learn. 
Yeah, kudos to you because in Greenwich Public Schools in our curriculum, we have some speed bumps and implementation um, of the Common Core and above other standards we have. So am I reading this right, that you've provided essentially a very smooth ramp that directly, allegedly directly intersects to what the kid's gonna encounter at kindergarten? Is that yeah, that's what we're trying to do, correct. God, that's fantastic. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Um, so this is early indicators, right? of some kids and it's a uh, there's two control sets two control samples right is that how i read this uh i wouldn't say they're controls it's a comparative study yeah so, so it's there not is, fully controlled right and there is no randomized control group right okay but it essentially says the 39 kids who went through it as compared to 98 kids who didn't here's their difference in score right of the kei correct Okay, and the it's on a what? The score is zero to one, one to three. It's in that first paragraph. One three. to three, with three being the highest proficiency. And the KEI okay, is so a, it, it's uh, in some of these it's statistically significant. That's fantastic. God, I wish you guys could do uh, do more of this. But David, I understand the challenge. Okay, can you just go forward one more slide? Yeah, that's what you talked about. Okay, thank you very much for answering those questions. You're welcome, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. All right, before you guys go on, I'm sure they can do more of this and I'm sure at the end they're gonna ask us for money, um, but that's okay, they should. <laughs> they're, great, they're great partners. Uh, all right, I've got a couple more hands, David. I know I, I, we're trying to keep you to uh, time, but, uh, but this is great stuff. Ms. Kowalski. Mentioned the, the cost component to this. First of all, I wanna say thank you for coming. This is all really, very, very interesting and um, really great stuff that you're doing here. So you mentioned the cost component to this. What are the costs associated with this and how have you been seeking out funding for these for this and for this solution? Well, well, thanks for the kind words, Karen. We, as I mentioned, we, we raised, took about 18 months to raise $1.2 million to fund the program for three years uh, when, we, when we started fundraising originally back four years ago, uh, four and a half years ago, whatever it was. Um, it, it's about $400,000 a year to run the program. Uh, we, we feel that those costs are, you know, we, we, we are very prudent stewards of our donor dollars. You have to believe that. You can look at our 990 and our, our program expenses and all that too. I won't get into that, but, but you can, I don't want you to take my word for anything. It's, it's all in black and white on our 990, what, what our program expenses are, what our admin expenses, and what our fundraising expenses are. So um, with that 400,000, David, how many kids can you um, allow into the program? Yeah, right now that, that pays for the two parent educators, all the expenses associated with that, and a maximum of 40 in the GPAT side. Mm -hmm. Greenwich parents as teachers, birth to three and about 200 children and one preschool instructional coach and everything that goes with that, the expenses on the, the, in the second prong, the preschool instructional coaching side. So with $400,000, you can reach out to, you, you can take care of the, the teacher solution, but you're reaching out to 200 children. 200 children is, is the, the, when I, yes, is the maximum number one preschool instructional coach. Now she's not instructing 200 children. Of course, that's a terrible right, right. She, she's, she's instructing the instructors. She's training mm -hmm. those trainers to, to on curriculum instruction and the best way to track data and, and get them all on one page and, and, you know, have constant, consistent quality data. So, uh, and that's, I think was 47 administrators and teachers she's dealing with now. Um, the, these questions have come up in in our donor presentations, which we've been giving since January, uh, just like this. And uh, the answer always is we can scale up whenever we have the money. I think the kids are out there to, to get them involved in, in this. Uh, but right now, you know, we're, we're we can't, you know, we, we don't, we, we don't have that money to do that right now. Yeah, understood. Um, 
Mo money's always the problem, right? <laughs> There's never enough of it. Um, yeah, could you, um, I know, I don't think this was circulated earlier to, to the board, but would it, um, would I be asking out of line if you sent circulated these materials to the board um, after after this evening? Mm, out of line, no, Karen. I'm always hesitant to do that because without our narrative around this, mine and Rob's and, and Jeremy's, it, it, it's a lot of it gets lost, and I'm I'm always hesitant to do that. I mean, this this is recorded, and that's great because our narrative is around it. If people want to listen to it, right? Okay. No, I look. I, I fair point, and I just thought I'd ask. Well, you know, I I, I like to. I'm still old school where I like to have you know paper <laughs> in front of me to take notes on and. Even COVID hasn't, you know, beaten that out of me yet. <laughs> well, I'm in that same boat with you, so don't don't feel ashamed about that at all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, all right. you guys are doing an excellent job. I appreciate your time tonight. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm going to tell you one more thing, and then if there's, oh, there are more questions. Okay, we'll go get into the questions. Yep, uh, Miss Downey. Um, David, this is fabulous to see a really data we've got data now to show we we're making headway with with some of these kids um and i do wish there were more money <laughs> to do more kids uh, but, but i think this is fabulous i think we've been talking about the achievement gap for a number of years and this is just something that's actually addressing it um at an early age which is all the more important um, a couple questions in terms of these kids who have now entered kindergarten is there follow up? Are you tracking how they're doing? Um, what kind of information do you have on that? Yeah, we well, we do hope to get data from Tony and her team as, as they progress, at least through through third grade is our plan. Um, mm -hmm. And, and to, to show that it's, it's continuing to, to make that difference. And, you know, data shows that it does, you know, the, the most important learning period of a child's life is the first thousand days when you can do it then. You can throw as much money as you want at the middle schools and the high schools, and that's great. And, and I'm not saying not to do that, okay? But if you can address the early childhood and get a quality early childhood education in these kids from birth to five, data and research and evidence shows that is when it makes the biggest difference, right? And, right. and that's why it'd be better, like even more data, right, to say what they're doing yeah, on track in yeah. elementary school, I think would would only strengthen the case, certainly with your donors, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, the further upstream you go, the better you are, Christina, with something like this. Um, just a question, like how, like you have the parent coach element, you know, how, how involved, can we just talk a little bit about how involved the parent slash family part of this is and, and how that is able to continue? Yeah, well, very. Uh, and that's part of the parent educator's role. Uh, not only do they, you know, when they could go in the home, right? They, they uh, being uh, working at family centers, you know, uh, they're on family centers payroll that we get invoiced every month for, and we scrutinize that invoice. We stay on top of the program with, with almost weekly calls and visits with uh, family centers management to track the program, to make sure it's working. When the parent educator goes in the home, because they are working for family centers, they can look around and say, well, you know what, because the family centers wrap around services, they may spot things that, you know, the normal trained, untrained eye wouldn't see, perhaps abuse of some kind, food insecurity, things like that. So it's great to have a family centers as a partner uh, because they provide those wraparound services. Not only that, mm -hmm. the program, I guess, a way to put it is trickles down to the other, there, there's one focal child, right? You saw Layla, mm -hmm. one focal child. And that's probably her only child. I think that's her only child. But there may be others in the household that the trickle down effect certainly will have an effect on them in a positive way as well, not directly, but but indirectly. But are they training parents and families on things they can be doing at home? Oh, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, Rob, yeah that, I mean, that's yeah, what Rob, the role is. Okay. Yeah, Rob, talk, talk a little bit more about what exactly those parent educators do. Yeah, so that's what they get trained on is they develop uh, kind of like a family plan, uh, like kind of any social worker, and they develop and track goals together, um, and they really help them advocate. The number of home visits is based on the um, identified stressors. So those, that could be like single parent, uh, somebody in the household is in the military or something, or somebody's incarcerated. So that kind of... Uh, designs your family plan and then you work on that with the parent and then we use those screening tools that i mentioned before life skills progression to track progress over time 
Uh, and, and, and so the what you said, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Christina, go ahead. No, I thought you were done. No, because I was gonna say, and why does the YM just no longer offer this program? I mean, you mentioned that it's just family. I know it's just family centers. Um, do they not have pre well, preschool there? Well, we're con we're you're, we're con you're conflating the the two programs in, in, into one. Okay. So it's GPAT, okay. which is birth to three, which is what you're talking mm -hmm. about. That had nothing to do with the YM. Okay. Our preschool instructional coach was inserted into the YM until they closed, went out of business. Okay. For reason you have okay. to ask YM about yeah. that. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Um, and is there anything like, um, just, I know things because my, but have you given thought to things that we could be doing in the public schools to support these children, you know, once they get there? <laughs> You're smiling, <laughs> am I playing right into your hand? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, a uh, little, little bit, a little bit. It's, it's like I texted you the that This question, is not staged, just for the record. <laughs> I did not text you a question, no. Well, to, to get us the most support we can to keep tracking these kids once they get there. That's really key. Mm -hmm. uh, for us to have the data because when we you know we started this i'll give you a great example of why it's important what what you just said and what i just said four years ago we presented this to indra Nui. everyone knows who indra Nui is on this call i assume right she said you know she was in my conference room she said it's great thank you very much see you later okay in january i called her up again met with her via zoom showed her this exact presentation she uh, stepped up at a leadership level to fund the program for three years, uh, a three-year pledge uh, at a leadership level because she was so impressed with what she saw. And because, you know, back then it was a concept, you know, it was a venture capital thing, you know, take a shot, you know, here's a concept that we have that, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. You know, I, we, we sold it the best we could and we raised $1.2 million. Great. Now, again, thanks to Tony and her team, we have the all critical data that shows it's working. Without that, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today and we wouldn't have the success we have today. To be able to go to the donors that we've been doing since January and having this you know, the fairly successful fundraising we've been having. But we're still a long ways from years uh, four, five, and six to fund that. And you know, I'm hoping for years seven, eight, and nine too. So we can really, really get and, and scale it up as well. And that's gonna take more funding. So um, I, I I hope that answers your question. So, um, but I will just add too, it's not just what the district can do for us, but how this program can help the district. And I think it was a, an important, you know, I read your preschool report last month. Uh, and there was a lot of really good information there around the birth to three component and how the district approaches that, uh, right? So birth to three is a free program uh, that any family can get access to. But once they hit age three, it's the district's responsibility if there's a concern or a delay mm -hmm. identified, right? And so if there's ways we can use the data from this program that we could like share with the district to make that an easier transition, uh, once a development or a, a delay is identified, you know, to learn more about the family. So it's an easier, when you start those PPT conversations, mm -hmm. how can this program help transition the, those children uh, and make it easier for the district? I think that's also an important way to look at this program. That's a, that's a great point, Rob. Uh, that's the other side of the coin for sure. And um, you know, our th this program, if you think about it, makes Tony Jones's life a little bit easier. And it makes parents who have children with special needs lives, hopefully a little bit easier because they're identified earlier. And to get to the, the fiscal side of it, hopefully I see it also saving us taxpayer dollars. All of us pay taxes in town. And if we can mitigate these issues as early as possible, uh, we're saving taxpayer dollars. So um, we need to continue this. I, I, this is one of the reasons I wanted to present to the Board of Ed to show you what we're up to, to plant a seed. Uh, yeah, Peter, yeah, maybe Peter Bernstein, maybe sometime in the near future, get in your budget to help us help us fund this because it, it's, it's helping everybody in town, everybody. Lucky for you, David, a lot of BET members are on tonight and they're listening to your success. So, <laughs> And I think maybe you want to present to them as well. All right. Ms. Go, Olson. go to the next person. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Olson. Um, thank you so much. This is so phenomenal. And, you know, early childhood education is of just paramount importance. And basically what you're doing is you're, you know, setting these kids up for success in a way that that they didn't have before. So, you know, I'm all about, you know, 
if it's possible to scale this out. And I know that takes finances and, and, and donors, but the, you know, the, 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 the more we can do with this, the better, because there clearly is a need and your, you know, your data is showing that it's, it's, it's working and it's working, it's working well. Um, you know, I'm also, I agree with Christina. I'd also be interested in just making sure that we follow up, you know, maybe that's on Tony or, or continuing to see, you know, um, to track that data, to show that sort of, like you said there, this is, this is in its baby stages, right? I mean, it's in its third year and we, we need five years to sort of run it through, run it through its full course, but, you know, to keep track of, you know, to, to continue to gather that data um, because you're right when you said, you know, you can throw things at a middle school. I've, I've taught middle school and high school my whole life. And, you know, it's all about, it's all about instilling that foundation in the beginning, you know, um, and what a beautiful thing to be helping the parents to help their children. You know, there's that's that's how it works. It is it is it is a family program. You know, that's how that's how you instill a growth mindset in a child. You teach a parent who teaches the child, and and it becomes a whole family, um, you know, affair. And honestly, also, um, you know, I used to way back in way back when my Greenwich High School days, many many years ago, I actually volunteered at family centers. So I'm like, oh, this is right up my alley. You know, this is this is this is so special what you're doing. So. Well, thanks, Megan. Keep up the good work and let us know how we can continue to help you and, and let's keep tracking that 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 progress. All right, well, thanks, Megan. Family Centers have been terrific partners. Um, you know, and so is, you know, I have a hotline to Tony Jones. You talk about responsive. I don't think 15 minutes goes by. She doesn't return a phone call or an email. And to, from me uh, requesting something or asking for a meeting or, or I, I'm, believe me, she has, uh, without her, uh, again, I, I can't praise her enough. She has been a terrific partner in all of this. It's always nice to hear and probably not surprising for a lot of us. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm even more amazed having heard the second part of the presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if funding were no issue, we, we, you know, uh, what do you think the level of need for these programs would be in our community? As in how many families do you feel would step forward to be able to participate in both of the programs, uh, you know, yearly? I would say hundreds. I, I think that um, per, her Department of Human Services, I, I don't know if Demetria Nelson is on this call or not. I don't know if she can talk or not. But when Alan Berry was, was head of the department, we asked him that uh, early on when we were developing the program. And it was somewhere in the line, along the lines of like 400, or I want to say 500 was the number, between four and 500 uh, of kids would fall into the categories. I don't have the breakdown who would be um, the GPAT side and the PSIC side, I, I think more would fall into the preschool instructional coaching side, but certainly um, if we can set, as someone said, set these children up for success uh, and a quality early, early childhood education, uh, especially in, in this town with, with the way we deliver programs, uh, sets these children up for success, success as, as you said, but also most importantly, breaks that cycle of of poverty, of, of, of failure, of, of everything. And, and just, you know, raises these families up and out. And it, it makes all of a sudden, all of a sudden housing more affordable. We know that that's a, 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 a lightning rod topic in town. Uh, it, it just helps, it helps a plethora of things. And this organization, meaning the Greenwich Shadow Way was almost prescient four or five years ago to pick this as a direct impact program, right? Who knew a pandemic was gonna hit? Nobody. Because if we started this program now, today, or even a year ago, we would be up the creek without a paddle. Uh, a McKinsey study says that at-risk children, and these are the kids we're targeting, at-risk children, if, if learning continues remotely throughout to, through June, which you know in some way, shape, or form probably will, they're gonna be set back like a year and a half of learning, right? So this, this program will set these kids up for success as they get to kindergarten and beyond and just solve a plethora of issues that, that, that society is, is uh, thrust upon them because of the boat they're in. Um, I, I, uh, this, this program, you know, I couldn't be more passionate about it. I was gonna say, I can hear the passion come through um, in your responses. And honestly, your passion is infectious uh, in a positive way, unlike other things that are infectious these days, <laughs> COVID. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I personally am very happy to log on and and uh, and and uh, 
help towards this pro um, you know, program. But um, one last question, you know, you know, this is sort of my area of my background. And so, you know, in addition to early childhood education, in, in addition to um, discovering um, and screening for issues earlier, um, one of the other biggest, one of the other big indicators to help for ch uh, children to be successful obviously is parent engagement. Um, it's kind of, kind of a key to a child's success within um, the world of education and, and life in general. So, um, you know, I know that you were talking about the support that's given to families, um, you know, in within your program. Um, and while you're following these students as they move forward, um, are you planning to try to offer some support or check-ins at least um, once a child has graduated to, you know, from your programs, um, you know, to sort of see where they are, where the families are, what type of support they might need. Um, oftentimes I know pa parents aren't always aware of what else is available to them once their child has aged out of some of these programs. They may not know where to look or who to ask. So it's just curious what sort of uh, additional support you're, you yeah. might offer. That, that is a plan, Karen, once they do get out of it. And that's something we're gonna look at um, shortly uh, before that full dosage period, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is, is up. Uh, we have to focus on, on getting the data and the and this program delivered with the fidelity we're delivering it with and the, and the quality outcomes we're delivering it with. But that is, is certainly a, a future strategy that, that we will employ uh, you know, to track those kids and make sure that you know, they continue to navigate successfully and be advocates for themselves as the GPAT side of the program teaches. I was going to say, I know that, you know, within our special education, you know, area, we're doing a lot more with family engagement. It's part of our strategic plan um, and something that we're discussing. So I, I just, I think this will be a really great, um, you know, thing maybe again to, to connect with. So I'll, I will let uh, the next person ask a question. Okay. Thank one, you. I'm going to follow up with one quick more thing. You said you're going to log on right away to everybody. Right that's minute, but I'm going to meet everybody that's <laughs> listening. Um, give me a call or email me. I want to talk to you about our drive to 425. And I'll leave it at that. Before you log on or do anything on our website, I, I want to talk to you about a, a, a special fundraising thing we were launching. Uh, well, kind of, well, probably publicly right now because this is public right now. So um, our drive to 425, as I said, it's about 400 to 425,000 a year to run the program. Uh, we have a special uh, initiative going starting like right now, I guess. Now, Jeremy, I know he might not be too happy about me talking about it, but I'm talking about it. So anybody, reach out to me we can talk about that and uh, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff kind of a kind of a crowdfunding thing for this so uh that's how we're, we're looking at it so anyway so still more questions joe oh i'm not supposed mr. to say kelly. that peter you're supposed to say that no that's all right mr kelly <laughs> okay hey david how are you i just wanted to chime in a little bit and say uh, it's great work you're doing my Thank colleagues you. are much more uh, suited with the questions so i listened to their questions and and I got all the answers I needed, and I really appreciate that. I didn't want you, uh, uh, I didn't want to be sitting here quiet thinking that uh, I don't really appreciate what you're doing. So it's great stuff. Thank you very much for doing it. Uh, I'm on board. You know, my, uh, my help I do in a community to a very small degree is at a much older age with the, the kids and sports and things like that. So just what you're doing there, it's, it's nothing I'm, a, I'm a associated with. So I'm glad you're doing it, and it sounds like you're doing a great job. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. All right, Miss Stowe, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah, so I just had to say ditto now. David, you're awesome. Obviously, you and your wife have been great contributors to our uh, education system. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I really appreciate all your kind remarks and the opportunity. And uh, Peter Bernstein, thank you for this, this opportunity. I know I went over 30 minutes and- uh, It was worth it. But I, hope, I trust it was, I hope it was. Uh, thank you everybody. And do feel free to reach out to me for more information about the drive to 425. And, Again, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for all you do for the town as well, because these late nights, you know, no one's getting paid for this except the, the, the better town that we have to show for it. So appreciate that from all of you. Thank you. Well, th thank you for your partnership on this. This is an amazing program. Um, you've caught lightning in a bottle. Obviously, we don't want to want to lose the uh, lose the progress you've made. We want to see more. So, uh, you know, just please thank your staff. I, I think the uh, the, the staff that's going into the family homes, the staff that's working with teachers, they're amazing. And if you could, uh, if you could replicate them, I would, uh, I would suggest it. <laughs> they are amazing. Thanks, Peter, for that. And Tony Jones, thank you for everything. Bye, everybody. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you. All right. With that, we're going to move on to a, uh, our next topic, which is the review of achievement data and goals. So Dr. Carabillo and Mr. D'Amico, I'll turn it over to you. 
Good evening, Chairman Bernstein and members of the Board of Education. I'm here tonight to share with you our current data on student performance. As a former principal, I would always say to my staff that the numbers will tell you a story and that it is our job to listen. It's easy to become reactive when scores are lower than projected or overconfident when outcomes exceed expectations. I'd like to ask that we guard against both of these natural tendencies, especially as we look ahead to the highly anticipated state testing later this spring with some manner of results arriving in early fall. For now, I'd like to share with you a collection of slides prepared by our research department that gives you a better understanding of how students are performing based on two different learning events, the GPS benchmark assessments from Linkit and the STAR literacy and math assessments. A question I'm quite readily asked is how are our students doing compared to pre-COVID standards? It is to, you know, it is, it's natural coming out of an unprecedented spring where teachers were asked to pivot quickly to unfamiliar teaching patterns that one could conclude that performance would be adversely affected. The good news is that is not what the data is telling us here in Greenwich. Further, from a national perspective, the NWEA, the Northwest Evaluation Association, published their findings in a November 2020 document entitled Learning During COVID-19. They found that in the fall of 2020, students in grades three through eight performed similarly in reading to same grade students in fall 2019, but about five to 10 percentile points lower in math. I share the national perspective only to add clarity and validity to our local findings. I'd like to remind everyone that we are only scratching the surface and measuring the short-term and long-term academic and non-academic impacts of COVID-19. That said, the fact that we opened our doors at the beginning of the school year and kept them open with consistently, consistency certainly has benefited our students. You know, I wasn't going to talk about the McKinsey study, but since David mentioned it, you know, the McKinsey study was published in June of 2020, where they used forecasting models to predict learning loss. And he's right that if you were to remain in remote learning through June of this year, the expected learning loss was a year and a half. For students returning this past fall, interestingly enough, their forecasting models were showing a 3.2 month regression. And with the data that I'm going to share with you tonight, the good news is we're not seeing that wide scale three month regression. So before we look at the first chart, I just want to acknowledge several board requests for specific data sets. Dr. Jones and I met earlier today with Jen Lau, and I understand that appropriate additional data is forthcoming outside the parameters of this discussion tonight. So with that, um, Mike, can you pull up the presentation, please? Thank you. And we can go to the first chart. In this first chart, you will see a five-year look back on average fall star ELA scores. As you can see, the numbers across the five-year span are relatively stable. Next slide. In chart two, you will see the results of our early literacy performance in kindergarten and grade one. As a point of clarification, the reason it says winter next to the kindergarten is because we do not test them in the fall. That said, again, you will see in our five-year look back, relatively stable performance. Chart three. In chart three, we turn to math. On average, the fall star math scores are consistent with past performance. The one noticeable dip was in fifth grade. I'll share with you my theory as to why on the next slide. Next. When I noticed the dip in fifth grade math, I immediately went back and looked at the results from our fall administration of the fourth grade standards to our fifth graders by way of the benchmark assessment tool in Linkit. As you can see by the three highlighted standards, our fifth graders largely struggled with retaining these key fourth grade spring concepts. As it is, fractions and decimals always prove to be challenging concepts for students. But when you consider the fact that students didn't have access to manipulatives 
or the benefit of in-school learning, it is quite apparent to me that this is an emerging casualty of the COVID disruption this past spring. Again, this is very much in line with national trends. Next slide. In chart five, we now look at scaled score growth from fall to winter in star math. Again, average scale scores growth for the most part looks similar to prior years. We do see an exception in grade one and grade eight. Again, I believe our first graders overall growth is lower this year due to the changes and constraints of online learning this past spring as kindergartners. If it was at all impactful on anyone, it was certainly the most impactful on our youngest learners. The spring semester in a kindergarten year is critical. And this is one area that building administrators are drilling down to individual performance to better service our youngest learners. Next chart. Chart six represents fall to winter growth in ELA. As you can see, the amount of growth this year versus years past is noticeably less. I'm confident the root cause of this slower than usual growth is due to instructional changes we were forced to make to comply with COVID regulations. In specific, <sighs> delivery of instruction has been drastically redesigned to allow for various mitigation strategies, including social distancing, which also limits our teachers' abilities to work with students in one-on-one -on -one and small group settings, typically, especially at the elementary level. Students are often pulled for one-on-one -on -one or small groups to attack content based on students' individual needs. Having to refrain from that dynamic has most certainly negatively affected some of our students. Next chart. In chart seven, we shift our attention to the GPS benchmark data. This is a comparison of fall performance to winter. I think it is important to note that the time between these two windows was shorter than, when we, than what we would expect moving forward next year. Thus, the small increases are attributable to the actual amount of instructional time. I think it's also important to note that not every school gave the form A so that this is um, roughly 60% of our second to fifth grade students. Chart eight. This is just an example of the type of data teachers are looking at in Lincoln. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. At the building level, you can rest assured that building administrators are working diligently with their school data teams to drill down to individual performance. They're tracking cohort data and they're signaling to us where the uh, strengths and where the areas of refinement are. Again, the reason I've emphasized that these learning events are really valuable as an instructional tool is because it allows our teachers to drill down and narrow their focus for future instructional planning. Next chart. So in conclusion, Spring 2020, with few exceptions, students entered this school year with scores similar to recent history. And from 2020 to 21 year to date, students continue to make comparable nominal increases in star scaled scores of math. In some grades, students are making fewer gains in ELA than in prior years. Next slide. I brought back the slides that we shared at a previous board meeting on, in terms of how our remote students are doing. So if we could quickly go through the next two slides, these uh, should look familiar to you. Uh, this was um, showing you that, again, the intent for Lincoln is this. Schools typically administer the test in the fall to collect diagnostic baseline information, winter to progress monitor growth, and then in the spring to measure end of year expectations of the standards. So that red line there is the assumption that by mid-year, students should have received instruction on 50% of the content and therefore should have mastered 50% of the standards they've been exposed to. So if we can go to the next slide, same thing, this is just a representation for ELA. What we didn't have last time, what we have tonight though is the middle school. So if we can move to the next slide. 
So uh, the winter benchmark information in Lankit for middle school remote students shows that performance is similar to students in the building. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carabello, who will take you through the high school data set. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D'Amico, and good evening, board members and attendees. Uh, we continue with our achievement data at the high school, and generally the data is positive. Looking at this, this slide, you see that in conversations with Jen Lau and the high school administration, the data shows a minimal dip. We will be drilling into the data to see if we can de determine why this is happening. Greenwich still outperforms the mean score from around the country, according to College Board. And just to notice for you is 2017 was our high in the past five years. So we're going to go back to that cohort and see if there's something in particular that made a difference. So we will be working on that. Next slide. These are the number of AP tests that have been taken in the past five years. And we have a high of 2,662 tests that were taken last spring. I also got the number of um, AP students this year that are taking AP courses. And we have a total of, uh, let's see, what did I say? I just lost that. A total of 1,064 students are enrolled in AP courses this year. So you see that the most tests were taken in social studies, which is interesting. And then you see in the other uh, departments. Next slide. As you can see from this chart, our AP students who, are, who take the exams are performing at very high levels. They continue to outperform the United States percentage of students who score three, four, or five on the AP exams. Uh, as you see, the only department that seemed to not perform as well was the uh, STEM students who took AP. And in AP science, it was an abnormal decline last year across the country, not just in Greenwich. All AP science subject areas experienced this decrease in scores. The exams were different. There were more open-ended questions and fewer multiple choice questions. The pandemic had forced schools to go and pivot to asynchronous teaching and learning in March. And that is when the AP teachers begin the review for the exam. This year, in order to support, support the, uh, and mitigate the impact of remote learning, the AP teachers have access to online labs. It's called the Pivot Interactives. Students are required to analyze real events, videotape those events, and make their observations and measurements. AP also released this year in all content areas, some uh, video tutorials. So we hope that that will be helpful to our students who are going to be taking those AP exams in May. Next slide. These are our graduation rates for the last five years in our cohorts. And this is good news. However, we need to reach 99 to 100% in this district. The high school administration and staff are reviewing the data to determine what changes can be made to increase our graduation rates. We do have some ideas and when we get some more data and more information, we will be back to you and let you know what we're going to do. So that concludes our report on our achievement so far. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Carabello and Mr. D'Amico. Uh, discussion, board members, see your hands. Okay, Mr. Chair. You can go ahead, Karen, if you'd like to go. Uh, you have the fast hand, Peter, go ahead. Um, just a, uh, a housekeeping item. Um, it's, is someone going to send us the actual achievement monitoring report type document? I realize this is a presentation and it's a subset, but are we, should we expect a report like we've gotten in prior years or is this it? 
I, I might answer that. We this is just a mid year really report because we're we're reflecting on what's been happening in COVID. Generally, the report that you get that's fully, um, that has all of the achievement data would come in the fall after we actually get our SBAC results. We didn't take SBAC last year, so we don't have any of that. We will take it with, so far as much as we know, we are taking it this year. What we yeah. don't know is what results they're going to give us. They've said we will get them, uh, but we don't know how granular those will be. Yeah, Tony, the one we got in 2019, which, I think was the first one you presented. Um, it had a lot of data. It had a ton of data that was not SBAC. So I understand we don't have SBAC data, but I would hope you would follow that same report format that you presented the first time you did this. I'd like to get all that uh, data that's in there. It's actually helpful. It's longitudinal and it's granular. So can you go back and take a look at that report and look to provide that with filling in whatever um, data we actually have? There's a lot of star data in there, which we have. There's right. a lot of other data. It's hard to really follow this if we get totally inconsistent data sets. Uh, yeah, this really is not, this is not the same type of reporting tonight that you would get in the fall. And we would want to have a full year's worth of data. We didn't have star last spring either. So when we get into next fall, you'll, you'll see that very typical type report that you saw last year because we'll have a full complete data set. This really is to look at how are we doing? How did we come out of last spring? Did it impact our children? Do we really need to be concerned about the learning loss? That's been a really big question in the community. Um, but again, that full data set, that's what you would get when we have a full year's worth of data. We just simply don't have it this year with COVID. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I think we need to get a view of where kids are right now, because we've installed STAR in the system as a early warning system, a predictor, a forecast of how our kids are gonna do. And I, I, me personally, I'd really like to get an understanding of that before we roll around to do it. The other thing that's good news is, is that uh, under statute now, the SBAC data uh, will be published um, in the summer. It's required under law for it to be published under summer. It, it may have been that our district was getting it and holding on to it and sequestering it uh, till the fall. But I think the sooner we get that data out, uh, that will be uh, helpful because it'll be published, already published by the state. Um, I had a question for, um, I guess Mark or Ann um, about, can, can you pull that presentation back up? And can you go to charts, I think you called it chart seven, Mark. The GPS benchmark data, this one. Um, is this number seven? Yeah, that's what I referenced as seven. Okay, can you go back you want... one more? Yep. Um, I think this says, this is the winter star, winter fall to winter star ELA changes in average scale score, right? Right. So can you explain what what is the, one of these bars? Because I, I have a, I have a question about grades six, seven, and eight, but I want to be sure I understand what, it, it doesn't give you a number, so I don't really know what it is. Can you help elaborate that? Yeah, so this is the amount of growth a student would have made in terms of their scaled score from mm -hmm. fall to winter. And that's the, and, and it's averaged right. out. Averaged, okay. And I understood what you said about grade two, three, four, and five, your theory about small group instruction. Um, and it, I mean, it looks like it's like grade three, grade four, I suppose grade five falls off, but you know, it's not that bad in grade three and grade four. Grade six, seven, and eight is quite, uh, it's a very consistent progression down, quite substantial too. Um, but 
we don't do a lot of small group individual instruction at middle school. So I didn't understand what you were saying. Can you help elaborate that? Sure. So my comments were more specific to elementary because we use the workshop model. Right. That said, Peter, we do we do have the workshop model in the middle school as well, and there are small groups that are pulled at the middle school, maybe not as readily or as right. often, but th that that still exists at the six, seven, and eight level. But but aren't they enclosed? I mean, uh, Tony set this up with closed cohorts, right? For this year. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you're, you're isn't that what we're right. talking about here? FY twenty. Yeah. So this is between, am I reading this wrong? Is this between fall of 2020 and the winter administration, which would have been very recently, January, I guess? That's correct, yep. And it looks like we're way off in six, seven, and eight. It's very pronounced. And I get your point on lots of individual intervention at the elementary school level. And that would really help explain that. Um, seems to me we have a pretty pronounced challenge in the middle school. And I'm very concerned about that because that is going to cascade through to the high school. Now, the high school typically does a really good job of catching up all of the gaps from the middle schools. Is, it, is, is this more pronounced in one school than the other? Can you break this? Can you follow up with a data set that breaks it out by middle school? I believe we can. And I will just reference a conversation that we had earlier today with all of the Title I schools. And, you know, Mr. Beinstein is concerned about performance that yeah. he is he's looking at. Yeah. I, I, I think this one concerns me a lot, Ken, particularly since you highlighted it. It would be great to get you know, this is one where we don't need to wait for SPAC data and administration, what Tony was talking about, because we did fall and winter last year. We did fall and winter the first year we had COVID. We did, we've done fall and winter now. So we have a full comparative data set. If you could follow up with that, I'd be very interested to understand what's going on school by school. My next question, just in an effort to move along is, Anne, um, on, on the AP, and I don't know if Ralph or Judy are here. Um, th this, this is, you know, I don't know how to react to this data set because I don't know what the compares are. So I'm not worried about that one. What I'm worried about is the, I'm, I'm interested to understand the one that came before, the number. Yeah. Um, we jumped 400 tests. It is, it is so outside our trend. It's um, because in 2019, we had uh, 2,200 tests taken. I mean, I suppose it's good news. We all of a sudden got 400 more tests, but it's so outside the five-year growth trend. Um, do, do you know why that, what, actually happened that had that jump it's actually 450 deaths no i don't but i can find out i will inquire and get back to you okay and then because i'm wondering if it's some something that's happening because of what the universities are doing and it's going to no test or is it we took i've, I've been told someone remarked to me that oh it's because they lifted the limits which i've never really heard we had limits before on the classes we're not supposed to have limits on the classes so i'm just I, I mean i suppose it's good news but i think it's good news but i'm not sure what's really going on and it, when you match it to the next one which is um you know because by the time we shut down for covid almost two thirds of the AP had been taught. And then the exams, were, if I understand it correctly, the exams were adjusted by the college board to account for there would be a learning dip in the remaining parts of, they modified their tests quite specifically. 
Yeah, they changed their tests for that last yeah. year. Yeah. Yep. And I still so some of it they accounted for, some of it wasn't perfect. Right. I can you guys dig into this a little deeper and provide a more clear uh, analysis and ex explanation of what is going on? And I will do what I can and get back to you. Yeah, because I'm very concerned that whether this is a one off or there's something else we need to be doing. Peter, when you're at a good breaking point, we've got a couple other hands. Yeah, I'm. Um, Go ahead. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Um, well, I, I was actually going to, I, I know uh, we had asked, I guess, for a little bit more um, data from school to school as opposed to just grade levels. Um, I think, you know, I, we might get a lot, you know, as Mr. Chair was saying, a lot more um, information to see where, if, the, if there is learning loss and where, if we um, compare as compare apples to apples uh, within our own district. Um, so, you know, once we get that, I'd love to be able to have that conversation um, again um, with you guys, uh, sort of to see how we can best support all of our learners, um, especially if there is some version of a slide. So, I, you know, I know you mentioned that we uh, will hopefully get a little bit more of that soon. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for, for taking the time to look into that. Um, and one last thing I will say, you know, in regards to APs, I know that they changed the way the tests were given last year, as well as, uh, you know, not just the method, but how they were giving the tests. It was one or two questions in a much different format uh, than ever done before, but they didn't change the information that was required to be known by the students. Um, and I'm and wondering know. how we're gonna compare that again for this year, because once again, um, the method for which they are being given is going to be changed. Some are going to be done in person, some are going to be Going to be done remotely. Um, some are going to be done in the middle of the night uh, for our students, and it's going to be a, a major change for many of them to have to take a four-hour test sitting at home during family time. Um, so I, I'm wondering how we're going to just make sure that we can compare that data too. Just a, a note. Okay. Uh, Miss Olson. Um, okay, thank you for that, and I have a um, couple quick questions. Uh, our points. Um, first, I, I definitely I share Mr. Scher's concerns about the, the dip in ELA, like that sixth grade dip is, is drastic. So um, I'm definitely interested in looking, you know, taking a deeper dive into that, sort of understand that a little bit better. Um, and thank you, Mark um, and Anne for, uh, you know, including remote learners in this and then following up with middle at the middle school level with the with remote learning, you know, I feel like I, I need to mention, I'm sure I'm not the only person that's read the NPR article about certain students that are really thriving in remote, you know, that there are, we do have a, you know, a, 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 a certain um, subset of a population. There are a lot of students, you know, across the nation that really do thrive in this. So, you know, sometimes it's portrayed as sort of a hindrance in learning. And I just want to point out that in a lot of instances, it's actually a benefit for, for many of our, many of our learners in the Garnish Public Schools. Um, I wanted to, uh, to just talk quickly about when we look at the, when we look at the, the bar graph, we look at the school side by side, um, we've always sort of done that. We've always sort of been presented with data, like here's, you know, whatever the, the, however many elementary schools here they are. And here's the, here's the chart. And it, it sort of trains us to sort of compare schools. It sort of trains the eye to be like, okay, here we, you know, and, and there, there, might, there might be a time and a place for that. And sometimes I think it's necessary, but I think if there's a way, and I'm just sort of thinking aloud and, and, and trying, to, trying to work through this, but if there's a way that we can sort of look more at growth in individual schools, if we can sort of see that growth within the school rather than sort of pitting, in a way it pits schools next to one each other, you know, and, and, and take the focus away from like comparing how is this school doing compared to the other schools, but yet, how are, how are the students within this particular school growing? How, where is their growth from year one to year two to year three? Like, how are they doing? Then we are looking more at the individual students. We're looking more at actually, you know, is there, are we achieving mastery? Are we reaching, you know, whatever, you know, are we, are our students mastering our standards based on, you know, we're not comparing. We're looking at we're looking we're looking at the growth model, and I think if there's a way for us to get away from one model towards the other, I'd be really interested in, in your thoughts on that, or or how we might be able to do that. Um, 
and and my points are a bit disjointed. But the last thing I want to say, while I while I still have the have the have the um, the floor, um, is just in terms of receiving the scores. Um, you know, and I'm not the only board member who's had this. I've talked to other ones as well. Where I received the scores, I think most recently, uh, Renaissance or you know, Star is now the Renaissance, from what I understand. And I and I I can't decipher them. Like I don't fully understand it. And if I'm on the board and I'm I'm involved and in, you know at this level and I still don't understand, then I think of all those parents that get these scores and I'm like, okay, this percentage, but this grade level, but this, and there's that paragraph underneath. And I I know we've mentioned this before. I know Mr. Bernstein has in years past. Like. I don't get it. <laughs> and if I don't get it, he doesn't get it, she doesn't get it, you know? So I think we need to really hone in on the communication like to our to our to our parents. Like what do these scores mean? Um, and we need to lay it out in very um, I mean, I need more uh, uh, easy to understand terms. Um, so we need it, I, I think we need it, it to be digestible. That's a word, I'm not sure, but we need to be able to understand it and we need to be able to interpret it. Okay, we need, I need an interpreter for these. Um, and, and so that's something I think we really need to work on as well. Megan, I would 100% I would agree. And I think one of the vulnerabilities of the STAR platform is in the way that they report out. You know, when you look at the individual student report, it will say um, Megan scored 825. Students who scored within this range are likely successful with the following concepts. It doesn't drill down to what Megan was successful with. It gives you that comparative data based on where the child landed in terms of their scaled score. And that's not particularly helpful to teachers. And that's what we've heard over the years is that teachers need individual student performance in order to drill down and then determine instructional entry points. STAR doesn't give us that. Now, I'm not saying we should throw STAR out, but I'm also not saying you shouldn't look for something that may be more specific and in aligned with the things that you're asking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, just, and um, just to follow up on the other point earlier too, because I didn't give you a chance to talk. I just like threw three points at you. Um, but in terms of comparing with the bar graph, so back up what the bar graphs to being able to see the growth within schools, that's something I know we don't need to get too you know, two in the weeds on this, but to be able to, do you understand what I'm saying with that? Like, is there, is there a way yeah. we can go with that? Yeah, my, my only challenge, and I'm sure Jen can find a way to work through it. Um, I like to look at matched cohort data. The problem with this year is many of our students aren't in the same place. A lot of, we have over 600 students that started in remote school. So to, you can't, they're not being batched together when they're taking the assessments. They're not in the same school anymore. So I, I would imagine there's a way to work through that, but that's one of the issues uh, I think that, that's slowing down um, the data poll. Mm -hmm. But match cohort is absolutely the best information we should be looking at. Yeah. All right, great, thank you. All right, Ms. Kowalski. Hi there. So I would echo Megan's comments on that, uh, uh, basically a cheat sheet or a guide on how to interpret, you know, the results. I, I think even the format, the format is different from elementary school and the middle school, and I don't, and the middle school's format looks brand new this year, and it's just, it's confusing. Um, I, so I think it might be helpful to send out some type of, uh, I don't know, a, a document or a letter just to help parents understand precisely what they're getting because I, I agree it um, and I think it can create some unnecessary um, nervousness about how your child is actually performing because it, it, it's very cryptic. Um, but to this slide deck, um, I just I, I want to challenge the, the concept a little bit of I think there was a comment made at the beginning that we didn't see we saw a, a minimal slippage or a minimal dip in performance. Um, or, or I can't noticeable. remember. Noticeable. Noticeable. Okay. So I, I just want to challenge that a little bit, Mark, um, because if I'm reading the bar graphs correctly, um, in some cases, uh, it looks like there is an, a noticeable dip. So first, let, let's look at, um, it, I'm looking at the, the deck that got sent um, in, in the board docs, but it's um, my slide six, which is fifth grade pre-assessment link it 
on fourth grade standards give gave insight i don't it looks to me as it's six but it might be something different it's the one that shows um the selected test grouping it's yes go back to that one one more uh yes that one thank you so am i reading this correctly that this was a the fifth grade pre-assessment on fourth grade standards and the fifth graders on several uh, on the ones highlighted so 54 percent of the fifth graders did not understand this fourth grade standard what it so if you look at the top of the chart it says 80 percent then 60 to yeah. 70 40 59 what it's saying is that a student that for, uh, 54 percent of the students we're able to master below 40% of the questions that were asked to that standard. So let's just tease that out a little bit. If it's a fifth grade pre-assessment on fourth grade standards and you have 54% that are scoring below 40% on the particular standard and then another one 68%, another 55%, it isn't I don't know if this is if this is all of the fifth graders um, that are averaged into this, but that seems to be a clear indicator of some key slippage. Yeah, Notable and that's slippage to use your word. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. Those are complex concepts that are traditionally taught later in the school year. Um, teachers certainly are diligent about making sure that they're covered before the students are exposed to those um, questions on the SBA. But again, knowing the way instruction was delivered or wasn't delivered in the spring, it certainly does speak to why we're seeing these, um, these, these scores um, right now. It is instructional loss. There's no way around that. Okay. Yeah, I just, and then I'm seeing a little bit, if we go to the next slide down, right, it's, um, if we look at the, this, result, I, you know, I think I share both um, my, my colleagues' concerns that have been voiced before. I mean, we see a, I, I, you know, this looks like a big decline for first graders. It looks like second and third graders held their own as well as fifth grade, but we see slippage in grade four, six, maybe seven and eight, you know, power to the eighth graders. But I, I think there are these, it looks to me that there are, there are noticeable slippages. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't disagree. And I think we need to drill in uh, a little bit more specifically at the middle school. I don't think those were necessarily anticipated. Mm -hmm. You would think with more independent learners, you might not have seen that um, in comparison to the first graders, but we are seeing it. And it's something that the middle school principals are concerned about. Okay, then the other question I had, if you go to the to the next slide down, um, with respect to language arts, I mean, you're seeing a decline in, in every grade except one. Yeah, yeah. And again, I attribute that to the way that we're delivering instruction this year. We know scientific research-based literacy instruction is not standing in front of the room. Unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions this year, there has been a lot of teaching from the front of the room. And, you know, we know that's not best practice, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it's some of the things that we needed to endure in order to get our children back in school. And so if you're going to have a trade-off, um, I would think most people would agree, you'd rather have the children in school deal with the constraints, still see, see relative growth and why perhaps it's lower than it has been in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I would, I would challenge that, that I agree the instruction has certainly changed and that I think everyone on this call um, and beyond given even the national discussion on this agrees that it's better to have kids in school. But I, I think my comment really goes to the first point that you said we were seeing um, you know, we weren't seeing noticeable slippage. And, and I'm pointing out saying the conversation that we've last just had in the last five minutes suggests that there, there is significant slippage that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think, you know, I, I asked, I think I, maybe some others, but I know I did ask for some more detailed numbers to drill down on this because I think relatively 
you know, this is concerning um, that I think we have some major gaps that need to be achieved and we need to figure out strategically how that's going to be um, how that's going to be managed. Um, look, I know it's not anyone's fault. Like it is, you know, I hate the saying, it is a, it is what it is with respect to COVID, but um, I, I think we definitely have our work cut out for us and I don't think we should underestimate the work that we have in front of us. The last comment I have on this for this evening um, in particular is if I go to what is my slide five, which shows the average September 2020 star mass scores in line with historical experience. Um, if we look at this, the one thing that jumps out to me here, and which is why I, I asked for some more um, in-depth analysis of the numbers by class and by grade over time is, while this is being portrayed as we're not seeing a noticeable dip um, in in scores except for the, the fifth grade, I would argue we're not seeing any movement whatsoever in this line. So even putting aside September 2020, if we take that chunk out and we look at the line of 16, 17, 18, and 19, we're also not seeing any improvement. We're seeing, uh, I'm seeing straight lines. I'm seeing stagnant. And I would hope that we would actually see growth and improvement in those numbers over the course of time. So that's the other question I raised that I think it, more numbers that we've asked for will tell us. But I also think that's an overall concern. It's not just the slip it in COVID that we're seeing here, but I think we're also seeing a set of, it's been stagnant. And I think there's room for improvement because I don't think we should be happy with stagnant. I think we should be happy with that number trending upwards, all, all of those lines is just my yeah. opinion. I don't, I don't disagree, Karen. And I think the intent really of this slide was simply to answer this question. Where did our, where, what was the entry point for our students this year um, relative to past years? You know, could you tell from the very beginning when kids walked in our doors, whether or not we had a significant problem on our hand? And if you look at where their entry point scaled scores are in STAR, it doesn't necessarily show that by way of comparison to the last four years. But I'm not saying, and I'm not suggesting that that doesn't mean as the year has evolved that we're not starting to recognize and identify those uh, learning deficits on a grander scale. And I do think, again, I don't like to pit school versus school in terms of performance, but I do think if you wanna understand the scope of a problem, you do need, do need to look at it in its entirety and then determine whether this is a district-wide issue in a specific grade or whether it's a small group of schools that perhaps brought some of these numbers down. So again, the data does tell a specific story. Breaking it out by school will certainly um, allow you to see whether these are district issues or school-specific issues. Sure, Mark. I, look, I'm not denying that, you know, whether it's, I, I'm not saying one way or another it's a district issue versus an individual school issue. I, I think drilling down to the numbers points to where, you know, resources need to be focused, right? It, it's more so of saying, um, you know, we got the kids at one particular school that their grades in comparison to another school, it's where we need to allocate resources and make sure that our students are getting um, the attention and that they need. And that's why I think the, the breakdown is, is really important in that and where we're seeing um, where we're seeing the slip is just. But I just, my overall comment is I think the there is a significant gap here that or slippage that I'm that I'm seeing based upon even these average numbers. But I also make the broader comment that the focus should also, you know, we've got work to do on the COVID piece, but the focus should be also be is those numbers, you know, we should not be happy with a static line. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Miss Downey. Um, a number of points I was going to talk about have already gone, but um, I just wanted to say thanks um, to Mark and Ann. And I just wanted to say how pleased I am to see that was a great example, Mark, of how we're using the Link It system when you talked about the specific skills and where the gaps are and really taking 
it as a learning tool and saying, okay, looking at this and you were able to identify the particular academic points that needed to be worked on, on the math, the fifth grade math, the fourth grade math. Um, so I'm just really happy to see that a tool we're now using is proving itself to be um, as, as predicted, as successful as in terms of a teaching tool. All right, Ms. Stowe. Um, thanks so much, guys. I think that for the what you pulled together here was very helpful because the purpose was to see how we are doing in terms of with this world of COVID that we're in. And I think that it's important to recognize that it's not as bad as it could have been, right? And there's a lot more work to do, but um, it feels, you know, given where we are, it feels pretty good. But let's talk about how we, some of the, the concerning areas. Um, one of the things you keep pointing out, Mark, which is, which is why we know, um, or, or you sense perhaps why we're not doing as well as in ELA as in prior years. I mean, I also just wonder, I could say just talking to people in the community, kids seem to be reading less, I think during this time. Um, and, and that's just simply what you're doing at home at night. And I've had a lot of friends comment on it because look, these kids are just getting through COVID sometimes. And I know a lot of parents are not sort of enforcing that let's do another half hour reading at night because they just want them to also have a little fun. Um, so to me, you know, reading is always the answer in, for ELA is how, you know, how much you read at night. Um, so that's just, you know, that's anecdotal. Um, and, and you can comment on that in a second, but I just wanted to focus a little bit on the, on the good news on the math side a bit. Um, and how you're not, you're seeing nominal increases in the star scale scores there. Is it too early to say that was because of math interventionists or can you sort of focus on the positive there and tell me what maybe worked there on that side of the house? Yeah, I think it would be premature to jump to that conclusion, but I can certainly tell you that having math interventionists this year has been incredibly important in our remediation efforts. And I think so much so that um, I think you'll see probably before the end of this year, a plan for us to try to increase the amount of math interventionist time we have in each building. I think, you know, we have to hit the ground running this fall when we come back to school with the hopes that much of what our constraints are this year have been removed because we really do have some issues that we need to attack aggressively. And I think that the math interventionists are key to that work. Okay. Um, can I ask a few more questions, Peter? Um, uh, sure, it's 848 though. Just no, okay, no, okay. I, 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 am just I am generally more efficient, my eye. so. Um, real fast, on the star early literacy slide, um, is the K1 crossover there, is that just because you top out with the early literacy score there or is there something happening there? No, that's correct. Okay, I thought that was maybe what the case was. Um, and last but not least, um, one second, one second. Um, okay, Anne, I have to ask you a question. So I'm going to the high school for a moment. Well, actually, first of all, Mark, um, you're basically principal right at the remote learning school. I guess you could call me that. So congratulations. I mean, should we look at Glenville scores and then the remote learning school? I mean, you, you're you doing a great job. I'm just impressed. So well I, done. It's, it's all the teachers. They're doing, <laughs> fan, they're doing a fantastic job. They really are. Um, real fast, Anne, on the AP scores, um, as you're doing the analysis, first of all, I guess if you could show me the details, because I don't see a 400 jump at least from year to year so if you could maybe show me the number of tests over the past five years when you're doing Peter's analysis but can you also at one point I know I've asked for this in the past break out maybe threes versus four and fives because I, I just know generally like I don't think threes are sort of accepted anymore at least at a lot of colleges and so it would just be good to see that differentiation when you're doing your analysis. Sure. Be happy to do that. Cool. All right that's it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, before we circle back to Peter and Karen, uh, one 
reiterate the data request. I know I submitted one as well for longitudinal data and, uh, and you know, watching cohorts as they move through the years. So be looking forward to seeing that. But I, I want to circle back to something Megan had mentioned, um, you know, which was the student growth focus. And, and it, it made me wonder, do we have any, uh, any goals that we've sort of written out for where we would like students to be this year? Uh, I know we're, we're looking at the data, but do we have a goal and, and is it documented somewhere? I guess Mark, not that's that you were in. Yeah, not that I'm not that I'm aware of that we set a specific target for this year, Peter. I think there was there was so much concern about what the impact would be. I don't know that necessarily there was a, an advisable number to post at this point. All right. Well, given there's I don't know seventy odd days left in school, somebody probably knows the number. Somebody living in my house probably knows the number. Um, you know, I think it's probably a good time to to take a step back, look at your data, and say what can we get what can we accomplish by the end of the year? I just think having a goal is a really helpful way to, uh, to move things forward and, and frame the uh, discussion. All right, with that, Mr. Chair. Um, Mark, I wanted to uh, just call to your attention a couple things, because there were a couple things that were said that were, I think need some emphasis. Um, and I give you fair warning, I've done a lot of studying on this already with Renaissance. Um, and I hope, I, I don't know who runs Renaissance for us, but maybe they need to spend some more time with Renaissance and dig in. Um, I, I agree with what Megan, I, many, many times I have raised all the way back to when Irene Parisi was here long before Megan was on the board that the star report that Irene Parisi at the time had selected and was sending home was just, it was pretty much useless. And um, it turns out that from star, there are many different versions of a parent report that can go home. So it depends on what the district selects. The standard reports from star that can go home are exceptionally detailed, they're very comparative, and they're written in plain English. They also have exact copies of them written in Spanish. So I'd like to hear from you guys on, you know, what have you reviewed? What did you pick? And why did you pick it? Because um, there's some really rich information available from Renaissance as a part of the STAR 360 reporting, which is the standard reporting package for the product. Um, the other thing, Mark, is I didn't understand what you said about trying to reconcile the remote school into the schools themselves. Because as I recall, when Tony Jones presented enrollment, um, remote school students were included within their home school. So I'm sure we have that data in the database and it, I mean, I just know, just trust me because I do this for a living, not a hard query at all to say, give me all the students and roll up the data for every student that's physically assigned to a particular school. So I, I would hope you guys would be able to show that. And to the degree that that also illuminates um, maybe there's not as much decline in an individual school. Um, it just maybe might have been the cohort of kids who opted to go to the remote school. It would be very interesting to, to look at that. The other thing I wanted to point out to you, and I'll leave it here, is within STAR 360, which is their reporting program, um, all of the kinds of reports that you're highlighting in Lincoln, um, are available based upon all of the STAR data. So as an example, there is a report called STAR Mastery Dashboard. Um, it shows by individual strand, which is skill, um, how a student is doing. It also provides uh, something that I, maybe Linkit does, I don't know. Uh, you know, Linkit, as you've said, is an instructional tool for the teacher. But um, STAR will show you uh, mastery progression. So in your charts here, as an example, you had 10, 10 uh, uh, things that need to be mastered over the year. And in Linkit, as you presented in the last meeting and in this meeting, 
it kind of shows you a score, but it doesn't take into account where the kid is in the particular year and there wouldn't be a score that they would be expected to have learned by now. Fortunately with STAR, uh, they take that into account and they show exactly whether a student is on track or off track given what's been taught and what they're expected to know at uh, the time that the test is administered. So um, it sounded like you, you guys were struggling a little bit on, on data and there's a rich data set already in place and you're administering STAR three times a year. It also provides a predicted progression um, to what outcome we would expect on the SBAC, whether a student is on track or off track. So um, I'm really surprised that we're not using and leveraging that data in addition to whatever you're doing with Linkit, um, because we have that data. It seems to me we need to, um, from the description, maybe expand the usage and availability of that to our teachers so that they have more a more rich and more complete data set um, in addition to whatever they have from Linkit, making the STAR data uh, more insightful than just looking at raw scores. And uh, I, I'll end it here. I guess I'd like to know exactly within what we've purchased with STAR because it's quite expensive. Um, it's very rich. It's used around the country. It is the, a, a gold standard. Um, or one of the gold standards. I'd like to know what we have in reporting and what we actually purchased. And if we need to um, enhance that so that we're getting more value out of all this testing data we're collecting, um, I'd like to hear the administration bring that forward. If that needs to be funded, then we'll find a way to get it funded. If, if I might just speak to two pieces, um, if that's all right. Um, of we course. Have, so for the remote school, they are actually enrolled in a K-5 fully remote school. So yeah, that's what I thought. Do, yeah, so and that state required that after the year started, right. Right. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to track students. So they're not, they, yes, we know which school they go to. We know which classroom they go to. Right. The school has kept that, but you can't actually go in um, and just pull that data. That's why whenever students move from remote back to the physical building, we must actually move them inside the system. And part of that was also some of the platforms as you can imagine that we use, they have a dedicated teacher in, for instance, in K-5, it's easier in middle and high, but K-5, they have a dedicated teacher. So when they move from remote, they're changing teachers when they decide to go back face-to-face. -face. So it's, it is a data warehouse um, challenge. But uh, in as far as the star data, we were actually all logged in today. I'm sure Mark was thinking the same thing because I've, I've utilized star since I think the first year I used it was 1996 and was actually in the beta even for star early literacy. So it is a program that I think has a lot more capability um, and has some components that we, we can utilize. Um, and again, we were just talking about that today. So I think you'll uh, hopefully we'll be able to get it to be more user friendly. We, had that conversation today about how parents struggle to understand scores because that's just that's not the world they live in. Um, yeah, Tony, what I'd like what I'd like to understand though is you know we're not the Renaissance dealt with this long before we did. So okay. I, I you know they know they needed a I mean just go look at the sample. So I, I always okay. wondered what it is we're sending and somebody ought to correct that. I mean look I don't want to go into the past. But, you know, there was an early commitment to get a learner profile, which put all this thing in English, which we already had. And there was a commitment from the administration almost eight, uh, 12 to 18 months ago to have it in front of parents. Yeah. It's, it's, it was committed in a meeting. It's on tape. You can go see it's in our minutes. That commitment was never fulfilled. No, it opened last year, Peter. It actually, we had it online last year all the way through until we got rid of ECRIS. And now we're we're getting ready to open it back up in Linkit. All of the data is in Linkit and Mark. No, I understand that, but I, that. my point is, Tony, I know you turned them on. 
but I know they were, there was no communication that went home to parents telling them it was there and what it was. No, there was, there was, we absolutely. And, and I, we were surprised actually that more parents didn't log in, but um, it'll be interesting to see when we roll link. Great, can parents. you, can you, since you raised it, can you just find that communication and send it to me, please? I can certainly look and find it for you. Yeah, um, but the point of it is, is here we are two years later and we've, you know, got to get it done. And I heard Mark very clearly in the last meeting, it was a very confusing because he said in one breath, um, this is the tool, we need to get it out. And then in the next breath, he said, well, but we need to slow down and run it because we need to explain to parents that this isn't really for them. And I'm, I, I just let it go at the time, but it's like, we need to, whatever it is, we need to send home more rich information to parents about where their kid is, how they're doing, and where they can engage and help with their students, which was Miss Olson's point. It's long delayed. It's been a problem for a really long time. And I would ask that we, we need to, you know, I, 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 look, we've had some things on our plate with COVID. We're coming out of this now. Uh, kids have real learning loss. I mean, anybody who doesn't think that is, uh, I don't know what planet they're on. So we need to leverage as much as possible making parents partners in education. And the only, one of the only ways we're gonna do that is if we give them rich, actionable information that they can work with. So the sooner we do that and more of that, uh, we need to get that done. All right, Ms. Hirsch, let's see if we can wrap it up. Um, well, I, I will just start by saying I echo the comments from several other board members saying that we've done a much better job uh, communicating with parents this year, but there definitely is more work to do uh, in helping making our parents uh, partners in education. Um, but what the question that I had was, you know, we are looking at data, we are looking at numbers. Um, but one of the things we're not focused on also is the social and emotional aspect of the learning in the spring versus bringing them back to the fall. So I just was curious to see if you thought there's any possibility that dips could be uh, related to the lack of student engagement um, seen in many students in the spring um, as students often thrive in the classroom through interaction with other students. Um, and many students might have checked out um, or developed some poor study habits, you know, if that's an area that we might need to um, add some support in as well if you think that has any uh, connection to, to the, the data we're seeing. Oh, I absolutely think there's, there's a, probably a measurable impact on the social emotional learning of our students. School doesn't look like it used to for kids. Number one, they're wearing masks. Number two, they're told not to go up and, hu and hug your friend or play with each other on the playground. They've been, they've been forced to deal with the mitigation strategies that we've required of them. And so I would imagine that the school is not the happy place it used to be when you were able to do the things you were able that you used to do. I, school just looks different this year. So it, is it maybe less engaging or, or less enticing for, for youngsters? Perhaps. Do they miss going on their Halloween parades? and celebrating their hundredth day of school where they're all knee to knee on the floor and counting out different things in hundreds. Yeah, and, and those are, you know, those are monumental and important learning milestones at the elementary level that unfortunately we've had to find other ways to replicate them, but at a socially safe distance and it's just not the same. So yeah, Karen, I, I do think that for, from a, from a social emotional standpoint, uh, it's hard for kids to go to school under these conditions. Well, I know you were specifically talking about the dips at the middle school and the middle school principals were concerned about that. And that was sort of what I was, I was more pointing to that at the elementary level was just 
uh, some of the lack of engagement for some of the students that, you know, in, in study habits and things like that, that may have continued from last year to this year. Um, and I'll just wrap up in that with the middle school and the high school and talking to the administrators and the guidance counselors. We definitely have a group of students that have been um, definitely impacted by having remote learning or having the hybrid learning that has really made a difference. And they are all talking about what we can do to support them from now to the end of the year and during the summer and next year. So that is something that they are very aware of. Okay, well, I, I'm glad that we're looking at it because um, I, I know I can see it with the hybrid learning in my house. Um, and I will just say, I'll just echo and I maybe will ask once we get uh, a little more data, that as all of us, I think, have asked for something a little bit more granular um, and longitudinal, that maybe we can put this back on the agenda before the end of the year so that we can see if there, there are things that we might need to put into place, whether, you know, sooner rather than later. So thank you. All right, Mark, and thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next agenda item. So this is a uh, update from uh, Karen and Karen on uh, the PCG special education review. And I think you have some process discussion you want to have with us. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Karen and Karen. Um, thank you. Um, I, I shared some um, information that was given to us by PCG. Um, as we had to move our meeting until uh, to yesterday, it, that's the reason why it, it was only posted today and shared with you today, um, but I'll go through it. So just as a quick update, um, we are basically finishing up with this phases two and three. Um, we, all the interview and focus groups, uh, parent groups and teacher groups have been completed. Parent and staff surveys have all been completed. Our student file review and focus groups have all been completed. Uh, our student file review uh, parent feedback survey has been sent out and is in progress. Um, those surveys were sent to parents and hopefully they've gotten a nudge as a reminder because they need to be completed by tomorrow. Um, they were sent out to uh, approximately 120 families. So we're, we're waiting for um, their, well, not we, but PCG is waiting for those surveys to come back. Um, and PCG had set up a specific email address for parents to share feedback and that will be closing on March 31st. Um, all the classroom virtual, vis uh, virtual classroom visits have been completed. Our peer district review and interviews um, have begun and are, are mostly completed by now. So we are entering really phase four and five, which is developing the report and the action planning and implementation um, support process. Um, so as we are entering that, PCG asked us to have a discussion on the report writing and action planning process and shared two documents with the steering committee, which outline action planning approaches that were used in other districts they've worked with, as well as a sample of an action planning approach and schedule for us to review. Um, just note that that is an illustration of just how action planning could be constructed and is not uh, necessarily an exact uh, plan, um, just to use these as a basis for our discussion. Um, and while the report will include actionable recommendations, it does need to be followed up with the creation of an action plan that details how we plan to prioritize and address those recommendations. The reason they're asking for us to discuss this now is that it creates an intentionality prior to the report being uh, published and, and available um, you know, publicly. Uh, once that report is out there, the question will always be, so what's next? Um, and for those who um, may not know, but the action planning process is once we've reviewed the report, um, we, can, we need to prioritize the recommendations that, and then we will need to take those recommendations and create a plan of action to address them by creating an action step, noting who's responsible for overseeing that step, noting what resources will be required, creating a timeline for steps needed when updates will be given and for full implementation and consider what the evaluation, evaluation metrics for that step will be. Um, to note our contract with PCG currently includes six hours of action planning. Um, so they'd like us to discuss how we'd like to use that time in order to create a strong and usable action plan. There are many different approaches as you can see from the documents that they shared with us. Um, and some of the examples that they had suggest that we look at through Arlington, Virginia and the Los Angeles United Unified School District. Those uh, documents are available publicly on those school sites, uh, those school districts websites. Um, there's really not just one way to do this. Every, dis different has a, yeah, every district has a different approach. Um, some have even asked for additional help. As you can see, some uh, districts had more than six hours of planning time. Um, so 
you know, the report may include many recommendations. We might need to simply prioritize five or six. Um, and we need to really be clear and level set expectations as it can often take three to five years to hit the benchmarks and complete goals. Um, but the key is for us to make recommendations, to take the recommendations to create actionable goals with set timelines and include an overarching goals and measurable, measurable objectives to get there and indicators, uh, key indicators for success. Um, you know, for those listening, action plans often start with the executive administrative team, but always includes conversation and touch points with the community and stakeholders along the way. Um, and so those are some of the suggestions that were given to us. And, um, you know, some of the suggestions are, are which stakeholder groups uh, and working groups we'd like to work with for the action planning committee, um, how, you know, who will be in charge of what. Um, and just to note that six hours of planning time is probably not enough to create um, a very robust action plan, um, but it will take us directly into the fall. Um, some recommendations might have budget implications. Some might have changes um, that are administrative in, in need of you know, staffing formulas or whatever. I, we have no idea what the, those recommendations might be. Um, and we do also, as a note, have parent uh, built-in parent community support for feedback um, through PTA Council on our SEAC. Um, a group. Um, so, you know, once there, uh, there is concern that once the, you know, the report is shared, it won't go anywhere. Um, but there is an expectation that action will uh, take place within the next school year in some capacity. So I think it's best that we, you know, I hear from what, you know, Karen and I can hear from the rest of uh, the board, what your thoughts are, um, so that we can really make actionable change um, and show that we're acting in good faith, manage expectations, and uh, set some priorities. But please do note that while we go through this process, communication certainly will be key. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add? Hold on. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, the, the one thing I would add is um, the documents that um, we received from PCG that uh, Karen had mentioned has some various action plan scenarios. I know these got circulated um, late because of just the timing of our meetings and such. And one suggestion I have for us as a board is to um, take an opportunity to to read them to, because I don't think you, you probably haven't had time to read them and digest them. And possibly um, you can either email Karen and I, or we can add this to um, you know a, a brief discussion to our next meeting to take any comments and, and work through them. Uh, just because this is, this is a lot of information and you probably want to, to have a chance to digest and, and think about it. Um, but that would be just my recommendation if we can fit some more time into one of our, up and our upcoming meetings or to actually, you know, have each of the, and I'm happy to reach out. I'm sure Karen will too, but I'm not going to volunteer her. Um, but happy to reach out to each of you after you've had an opportunity to take a look at this and we can uh, I can set aside some time we can all talk I can talk to each one of you individually uh, and I should also note one of the questions that we certainly asked um, uh, members of PCG is saying you know one of the questions the first question will probably be asked is how can we figure out how we want our action planning to be decided upon until we see what those recommendations are um, I know what my thoughts are based on this it's it and um you know, I, I think that there there are definitely things that will be divvied up uh, amongst different stakeholder groups, but um, to work together as, as a team, but um, we're open for questions. All right, thank you for that. Um, I just wanna kick it off, you know, appreciate the work that, uh, that you and the parent representatives and Dr. Jones are doing, making sure that they have all the information they need, uh, all of our staff that's all coordinate for, uh, for them to get everything. Um, you know, I, I looked through the document you sent and obviously you're right, we haven't had a lot of time to, uh, to, to dwell on it, but I, I noticed on page two, when it talks about phase four, it mentions drafting a prelim preliminary report and having that uh, reviewed by stakeholders as a preliminary report. You know, we, we started off with this and, and obviously we, all throughout, we wanna maintain the independence of the work that PCG is doing. So I understand the need to have somebody review it to make sure there's no individualized uh, identifying student data in there or student information. Uh, but other than that, I can't see, I can't see a need and I, I actually don't see a want. Uh, I think we would not want to have somebody looking at a draft and potentially making any changes other than identifying if any, any students could be uh, 
students could be pointed out by what's in the report. So, you know, I, I guess uh, in your discussions with them, it would be helpful to figure out how that could happen, whether that's uh, that's Tony or a designated uh, FERPA, you know, officer to uh, to look over the report and obviously noting if any changes are made, what they uh, what they were. But I, I don't think we we want to be policing their report. We're looking for their unbiased, untarnished. Uh, findings on on our program and how we can better deliver so i just uh, i throw some caution at that the the, uh, the other thoughts i have oh. you know there certainly were a lot of different um methods of developing the action plan i think based on where we are and uh you know what we've discussed previously certainly there's going to be a need for board involvement at least at the outset to set the higher level goals uh, you know, certainly some folks from uh, from Tony and her team, but I, I think the board's got to be involved. So I, I don't know that it's going to be, as, as Karen said, a six hour uh, affair. Uh, certainly, I, I can't imagine any of the board would object to uh, to holding some, you know, some special meetings just for for that purpose. And, you know, I, I know that you uh, you told us we could go look at those two, uh, the two school districts that you mentioned um, I did look at them. I actually like the one from LA Unified. It's got smart goals in it, which is something that uh, we've talked about for years. And I, and I wonder if they've got other examples because at the at the end of the day, right, the, the key is making sure that we've got an action plan that's actually gonna get action. So with that, Mr. Cher, I'll turn it over to you. Peter, I was gonna I just... address the draft report. Yeah, okay. before you're talking too fast, Peter. Um, Karen, if you want to, fine, I'm happy to do it too. Um, I will just note that, um, yes, this was part of my discussion for after we discussed the action plan, but there, there has been a desire um, shared within, you know, the steering committee um, to have that, if there is a draft report, to have it released to, you know, parents at the same time it's released to the board. It's not something that we would typically do. Um, it, we have been told by PCG, um, as well as administration, you know, that it needs to be reviewed in draft form, as you've noted, to ensure that nowhere in the report is there any personal, personally identifiable, by, in, eh, I can't speak, personally identifiable details for students or staff uh, in regards to this unique program we might have? Um, you know, and we did discuss uh, FOIA and FERPA concerns. Um, and I know Dr. Jones had made some suggestions as to what we might be able to do. Um, we can certainly, if we need to also ask uh, our uh, council uh, if, it would be covered under FOIA um, as it is a draft report and it is only uh, being noted for, uh, to ensure that there's no student data that is accidentally shared um, and any changes that they do, made, uh, do make, they have already said that they would include in an appendix. Thank you for that. All right, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's already been said, but I just wanna echo this. Um, I. I'm surprised PCG doesn't know how to scrub for uh, personally identifiable information. I mean, I think that's part of their um, task and given that they do this all the time, I'm fine to have somebody else uh, internally uh, do that or it, it's even better with a third party. I mean, let's call spade a spade. Um, there are a lot of people in the community who are, um, very interested in the outcome of this report, but um, you'd have to be asleep not to realize that in large sets of people, we have a substantial credibility gap. So I think it's absolutely 100% right that um, whatever gets released, good, bad, or indifferent, it's released to everybody at the same time, that there's nobody who has uh, preliminary copies of this and has seen them and edited them. So. I have confidence that the this can all be managed in the steering committee. And I'd like to be sure that both Karen and Karen uh, are providing direct oversight of that. Um, it, it's just to build confidence in the community. We're gonna have a lot of hard work that has to come after this. And uh, I think it's really critical that there's no place in this process that, um, you know, people who may or may not trust, uh, we've done anything that can uh, fuel that. Uh, not that it necessarily would happen, but we need the whole community coming together around this for the next phase where we're going to figure out uh, what we're going to do. All 
All right, Miss Downey. Sorry about that. Um, just a couple of kind of more processy questions, just in terms of, I know you want feedback from the board members, which I think is great, Karen and Karen, but if we're talking about, I just wanna, as we're looking at it and making a decision, we say we've only really got six hours paid for. So in terms of making a decision or a recommendation or what a wish list of how much time we want spent on this process, how do we do it from a, what we want versus what it's going to cost? I don't know, Peter, if you have any thoughts on that. I don't know that that's for me. I think, uh, you know, Karen and Karen and Dr. Jones have certainly been closer to it, so they may have a, uh, a sense of what the cost may be. Certainly, we're in the middle of our budget discussion with the BET, you know, whether this is something we can, uh, we'd be able to absorb in our operating budget or whether there's something we need to make a separate request for funding. Uh, we, when we took up our budget, obviously, we had talked about putting in a plug number for further, uh, further work, but we decided at that time that it wasn't appropriate. I, I would guess if we uh, if we could in the next few weeks, I mean, the, the BT votes on April 1st, if we can get data from uh, from PGC before then as to as to what the additional cost might be. But I don't know that we have a sense of the model we want to use. So it's a little hard to say we've got a number, which is why it's a tricky chicken and the egg. And, and I don't know if we fully exhausted. I think it was the hundred thousand that was already allocated. I don't know. Um, um, the other thing that was just there was a sample timetable in there, which put kind of next action steps um, into next fall. Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out when we anticipate really getting the report in, and having a board level discussion about next steps. Um, Karen and Karen, do you have any thoughts? Because so, I don't know if that was just a sample or if that was an actual. No, timetable. The, the original schedule, the timing. Um, for giving the draft report um, was the end of May. Uh, they expected at that time to have a two week review period um, with the final report coming June 30th, um, at which point they would present that to the Board of Education and prepare all the materials for the stakeholder presentations um, and then work to plan to have uh, action planning or retreat. Uh, and as you can see from the suggested timeline that they gave us, it's the last page of the document. Um, it would mm -hmm. be that action, those action planning um, sessions would happen over the summer um, so that we would have an actionable plan, um, well, actionable goals uh, with timelines and everything set. Uh, by the start of the fall. Um, and again, we do really need to level set expectations. There may be recommendations that we can address immediately. There may be recommendations that will take longer. Um, change takes time. And, uh, you know, that is why I think we as a board, since we are uh, ultimately answerable for, uh, for what is happening, um, we'll need to sit and prioritize those goals to then give them, um, that's my recommendation or suggestion, to give to um, an action planning team, um, which then can be divvied up um, based on what those goals are. Um, we certainly uh, want to include uh, all stakeholders, um, you know, stakeholders representatives within that group, including um, teachers, and parents, um, you know, to give everybody um, ownership and, uh, you know, over some areas. Thanks. It was just, Peter, I was just going to address Christina's comment yep, with respect to the, the cost associated with this. Um, one, I, I think it would be helpful for us as a board to come up with, with what we think is probably the, the best um, you know, approach and action plan and see where that lends us on the number of hours. And I think um, that may give, give us a, a better sense of it, but I think you know, one of the questions that Karen and I can take away, because I don't have the answer now, Tony may have, but I, 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 this, I don't think we've touched on this before, which is what would it, what would be the incremental cost to add additional hours for them to, for, for if we need more than just six, right? To me, six sounds kind of light, given the fact that on any given night on a board night, we can easily go into five um, just on our own. 
So um, one of the things, so I would suggest we approach it in the following manner. One, we as a board decide what action plan we like the best, what we think based upon that action plan, a reasonable number of hours, and then have a conversation with PCG as to what would be that additional incremental cost. Um, and, and to Christina's further point, where are we at in the spending process? My guess is um, we're hitting our number. I don't, I don't think there's, we, we, there's really, we have really used PCG and they've been working really hard. I don't think there's room where they can say, oh yeah, we saved here. Um, I don't think that's the discussion we would be having. Um, so I think what we just need to do is have that further discussion with them when we as a board have a better sense of what our action plan is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't think we need to overthink this. We have a ready, we have a ready source of funds available for this. Um, just as a reminder, uh, in prior meetings, it was revealed um, that uh, we are funding um, additional expenses and special ed in our current this year fiscal special education budgets that are in fact COVID expenses. As you know, the BET long ago committed to the Board of Ed an open checkbook for COVID related expenses. So if we properly take care of that, that's a potential spending source beyond the fact that as part of this plan, we're not gonna be out of COVID. So the, uh, we're not gonna be out of COVID by the time this plan has to get implemented. We're gonna be into this um, very, very easily. I mean, I'd like to be optimistic and think COVID will be completely in our past come September 1st, 2021. Um, my crystal ball is not that good, but I think we've all learned um, this thing's gonna, it, it is with us longer than we'd like. So with that said, we definitely need, because we have people who filed a complaint um, and other things, we need to think about not only special ed in post-COVID world, but we need to think about COVID in a, in a COVID world. And to me, that's a COVID expense. And the BET has agreed already to provide funds for that. And in addition to that, um, if the reporting is correct, we're about to have $11 million dropped into our bank account. So in addition to monies we've already got. So I think there are ready uh, funding sources. I don't think this is necessary to turn this into a complicated exercise. If we have to go get another 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 uh, to supplement the project, seems to me that's money well spent and it won't be hard to get. Somebody just needs to go ask. From your mouth, tell. from your mouth. Um, I, I would hope we could uh, we could find a way to do this without the ask. Um, all right, I think that's it on this. I, I think the ask from uh, from Ms. Hirsch and Ms. Kowalski is that we read the documents and be prepared to uh, to help set a path forward. Um, you know, we'll uh, we'll look at the agendas for upcoming meetings and see where it's appropriate to do that. Okay, just as a note, they do need to have. Uh, uh, information back from us sooner rather than later. Um, so even if it is a, a short discussion at our next meeting, we pr probably should have that so that they can properly prepare and plan um, going forward. Well, I, I guess what might be helpful then just to move the conversation is, is if you could come up with the key questions that you need answered by, uh, by board members. So if it's a, a matter of who the right stakeholders are or, or something else, it would be, be good to be able to walk through that in a linear fashion. And then yeah, we'll, we get can, the, we'll get to the answer a lot faster. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can simplify this process. Fantastic. That's what I was hoping you'd say. All right. With that, we're going to move on to our last agenda item for the evening, which is a uh, policy governance committee update as well as a first read. So, Ms. Downey, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, okay, um, on board docs, and I corresponded with everyone on the board, I'm gonna kind of take these in the order of my email. The first matter is we've talked a lot about the policy crosswalk where the board adopted a number of CABE policies, a lot of CABE policies, um, without actually retiring most of the accompanying procedures 
um, did retire some of the policies. Upon looking at it further, what the Policy Governance Committee, we've had a number of meetings um, in series. We're, our goal is hopefully to do this procedural element um, at least once a month with our meeting schedule, is to take what were formerly procedures, as, as you can see from today, a number of the E um, series, uh, which are already now covered by a new policy, um, a new CABE policy, um, and some of which need to be um, or should be moved into pr procedures. Now we're calling them regulations. Um, the board does not vote on procedures slash regulations. Um, but we wanted, we've spoken with Cave and said, what is the proper way to do this? So what we're going to do is provide any time we do this, um, the chart will give you a summary of what we've what looked at, which procedures, um, as well as the information thereafter. So you can see what the new policies were um, and the date of adoption by the board. And when we're making recommendations to the superintendent um, to take these old procedures and turn them into regulations. Um, but no board vote is needed when it's a procedure, um, only when it relates to if we, when we come across um, any policies that have not been retired, um, then those will come before the board for a vote. Um, this should have been done along the way, but we're, um, we're, we're doing some cleanup now. So we have a goal of getting through as much of it as we can in the next couple months. Um, and just continue to plug along. So I don't. Let's. I, I would rather let's talk about these if people have questions or comments um, before we move on to the next item. If that's okay, Mr. Bernstein. Yeah, that's fine. So I don't know if anyone has anything they'd like to ask or not, comment not, on. Not seeing any hands, I'll say it makes sense to me. Obviously, if new uh, procedures are put into place. Uh, the practice had previously been that the superintendent would inform the board of the new procedures. Um, and if anybody had comments, they could provide them. But of course, we don't draft those and we don't vote on them. And that's why we kind of, for the ones that, the old ones that are going to be adopted by Dr. Jones and the administration, that's why we put the notes in so that people could see. I mean, for example, I'm going to use facilities rentals, that it's basically um, she is going to make sure it meets what we're doing or what needs to be done. And it's it's her starting point for creating new regulations. And then these will be attached on board docs. Um, for example, you, you know, at, right after the policy, and then it will have the same number with the letter R as the designation so that people will be able to find it. But then these E's and the other numbers are going to be eliminated over the course of time. So. Um, assuming we're moving along well on that. Yeah, I'm not um, seeing next, any other hand, so why don't you keep going? Okay, it's not that exciting. <laughs> um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, naming facilities. It came to our attention, um, and we've looked at the naming policy, which is 7551, which we have on the books, and which talks about naming of buildings and portions of buildings. Um, we had a group come to us to talk about uh, plaque or name the track at Greenwich High School in honor of Coach Mongo, who recently passed away. Um, so we, we the, the committee had a discussion about looking at the policy, looking at this request, and we don't necessarily feel, there, there are different ways of approaching it, but we felt that this was a board level discussion about how we want to approach naming things going forward. For example, um, you know, I think we're supportive of the idea of doing something like a plaque or naming the track, but, you know, it's not covered by the policy, particularly as it's currently written. And, you know, every time we have a longstanding member of the community who passes away or a group comes to us, um, do we want to keep putting plaques all over our buildings and naming things left, right and center? Um, so we wanted to really hear uh, the three of us talked about it, but we wanted to hear the opinions of other board members before we started going ahead at talking about, you know, because we shouldn't craft a policy for a specific circumstance. We should craft a policy that we think is the right policy that then can be applied to all those circumstances. So, and, but we just want to kind of hear the, take the pulse of the board and hear what people's thoughts were before we move forward in any fashion. Do I, I mean, Peter, should I recognize people? You would, uh, I got, yeah, I got it. It's 
Okay. Joe, go ahead. Hi. Uh, well, my opinion on this one is, uh, 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 Christina, you said uh, uh, in reference to some too many plaques, too many people. Uh, it's if we work on, uh, like for example, the track and Mongo. Uh, if we raise, in, in order to put the plaque on the track, we, we'd expect an organization to, to raise uh, some money and, uh, and, and give the, uh, the, the Board of Education, the district, uh, that new track. And then in, in return, uh, the, the, the initiative would be to, uh, to name the track after uh, the coach uh, for the life of the track. And or if something comes in where we for some reason have to remove the name for uh, something controversial, which we know would not be the case with Mongo, uh, but with, a, uh, uh, with somebody else uh, possibly, but have ourselves protected in that way. But if the track uh, needs to be replaced sometime in the future, uh, then there'll be a new uh, opportunity to, uh, uh, for someone to uh, put a plaque there. Uh, that, that's the way I would look at it. So you don't have to worry about too many plaques as long as the money's raised, uh, the, the honor's given, and the uh, and the life of the asset is the uh, uh, the term of the uh, uh, of the plaque. So you would link a fundraising the cost component to an outside organization to the extent someone would want um, something put in. The, the, uh, that's what I think you'd, you'd want to do. You'd, you'd, the plaque is is an honor uh, given to the uh, a service given to the individual uh, or in memory of the individual. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, uh, the initiative would be the community wanting that plaque and creating an organization to raise money uh, to improve or create an improvement uh, within the school. And then that's that, that improvement donated by that organization in honor of this, uh, of this uh, a person, in this case, Mongo for the track, uh, then it would be there for the term of the track, yes. So that the, but any process like that would still have to come before the board for approval. I would, I would say yes, because uh, all the situations and circumstances are quite different, and we'd have to do a little research. One of us uh, would take the responsibility of, uh, of doing some due diligence on the, uh, on the individual being named and the, uh, uh, and the organization and the attentions and what's behind the organization. So uh, I would think it would take a board member or multiple board members to make sure they, uh, they vet the process and the, uh, and the organization and, and the naming. Thanks, Joe. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Sorry, I have uh, a couple screens open. Um, I was just going to say, you know, in, in regards to this, you know, when this first came to us, you know, I, I've done shockingly a bunch of research, and you know, mm -hmm. around the country, there are very specific, uh, detailed policies as to. Um, how things can be named. It, it, it's not necessarily if who is the one that recommends it, but it's not just always in regards to if, if you want to dedicate something to someone who has passed away. Um, it, it is about an uh, outside, uh, somebody asking the board. Um, and then there are very specific detailed um, requirements because you don't want to end up naming something after someone who, uh, uh, may have negative connotations or whatever. Um, and I certainly can send some of that stuff along to, uh, to people if they would like to, to read it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's looking for it or desperately looking for it. Um, you know, this issue came up when we were uh, doing New Lebanon and, you know, ultimately it was decided to, to not seek naming uh, historically, uh, building committees would uh, put up a plaque uh, naming the library and the school for the chair of the building committee. And that, I guess, had gone back a while, and I'd, I've seen a citation for one before. Um, you know, I, I don't know where you draw the line. It's really hard, right? We've got people who are dedicated to our students. We want to honor them. But once you start doing it, it's uh, how do you not honor somebody that was a kindergarten teacher for 40 years? I, I, don't, I don't know how you do that versus somebody that dedicated his life to coaching our students or, or somebody that spent nine years coaching the rugby team. So I, I don't know how you do it. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Well, it's, the, it's not a decision of ours to name it. It's the initiative and the benefit uh, to the community uh, that we would consider naming a facility. For example, if uh, one of our, uh, our, our fine and high regard uh, citizens of our community decide to fund uh, a building uh, within our community, 
uh, solely fund that building and donate that money to us to build that new building, uh, we would then uh, look at that person and see if they're credible enough uh, to wear the name uh, on that building uh, if, at, at the benefit of the community. Uh, if they're going to give $20 million to, uh, uh, to a project, uh, then we would certainly, or a fund or a foundation around that person, if the person has passed, we have to look at the benefit to the community uh, versus the, uh, uh, the decision to, to give that honor by naming the asset. So I think we have to carefully analyze that because uh, we have to, we can't lose my, the business side of me tells us that there's opportunity out there for us uh, to raise a whole lot of money to better our schools. And we certainly all are united in wanting better schools. Uh, if the cost of our better schools uh, were not out of our budget and we're from some other source and uh, using the naming uh, ability to do that, to raise that money, we'd certainly, I'm not saying we move forward on it on an unconditional basis. We have a lot of criteria using the information that uh, uh, Karen Hirsch has gathered and, uh, and some further discussions, but certainly the business side of me tells us there's a way of raising a whole lot of money to better our community. Uh, and if we're reluctant to give the name away, based on that, we have to look at the benefit of the community versus uh, giving the name away or naming something. Uh, that's my opinion. All right, Mr. Chair. Uh, Christina, what problem are you trying to solve? We already had a naming policy that was really clear. Wait, no, wait, you know what, actually, if you read it, it doesn't, like, for example, this circumstance, you know, the way it's drafted, it talks, it's kind Which of under a header of new 7551. Yeah. It's, it's under a header of new construction. And it talks about formally identifying, the board shall identify the need for a naming process. It kind of puts the initiative on the board. Um, to say we want to name something as opposed to people coming to us and wanting to not even name a building, put a plaque or, or kind of name the track. And so it, it prompted us saying that this the policy didn't really apply to this and we're going to have similar sorts of circumstances. So we wanted to just kind of see where people's heads were and what the focus is and that Are maybe you, we can go back to CABE and maybe. Yeah. I mean, were you going off the CAPE policy or were you going off the board's existing policy? The board 7551, which was our board, which we adopted in January of 19. Oh, okay. There was one that existed before that. I didn't realize that Gaetan Francis and Barbara O'Neill and team had, or I guess it was Kathleen, had replaced it. You might want to go back and look at the- Well, the whole board must have voted on it. <laughs> well, yeah, but this was this thing of flipping the manual and they came in batches and all the rest of it. But anyway, but that wasn't my point. My point was, is that um, when I came on the board and there was MISA, we didn't have a mm -hmm. naming policy. Um, I was assigned to a task force. I think it was Mike Bodson, me, Nancy Kale, if I recall. Um, and we went through this whole thing to develop this. And the gist of it was, we absolutely want naming. Um, the Mesa crowd came and said they needed clarity. They needed clarity because they couldn't fundraise without it. And that policy was written to take all that into account. And it accounted for... Um, it accounted for, you know, people were willing to do naming, but then there's a crowd that says, oh, it's a public school. And, you know, this gets into this big philosophical debate. And the, the point of it was, is that we've had a long history of fundraising. And uh, you can't go into Greenwich High School, can't see the brick wall without it. You can't see what the PTAs are doing without it. You, you know, you need this recognition thing that you need to be able to have. And we landed on essentially allowing naming, um, taking corporate gifts. You gotta take corporate gifts because so many people have matching programs. So if you don't say you don't have corporate gifts, then somebody who works at GE or, well, they left the state of Connecticut. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know a company that's left um, that has a, has a corporate matching, you want to be able to have somebody be able to do that. 
So you want to be able to recognize that and what have you. There was this, the only part they talked about trying to manage at the board, which is a little bit like managing free speech, it's really dangerous, is somebody started making saying, well, how do we prevent companies that want to give us money if we don't like who the company is? At the time, the What's example that? was GoDaddy.com, and somebody made some comment about their advertising in the Super Bowl, so they didn't think it was appropriate. I mean, I think that was the only rat hole that we wound up in. But the consensus was allow this, allow naming, and generally, um, our historical trend had been to name them after former educators, but that we needed a way to recognize corporate uh, donors. Otherwise, we are closing ourselves off from substantial gifts. But this wasn't, but this it was raised, this came up now, not in the context of any fundraising or gifts, but about honoring someone who's given a lot to the school district. So there was no discussion of fundraising by those who kind of raised the desire to name the track. There was no discussion. This was purely about honoring someone who's given to the school district. Um, and, and again, there's isn't always it like- in that Peter, part, in that part of the policy? No? No, it doesn't. No, it's not really in the policy. So that's what the problem is because it talks about the board identifying it versus individuals. And we can come back and say, if we haven't identified, I mean, this is an option and this is why we wanted to have a board discussion. If we just say, if we haven't identified the need to name something, then we're not going to do it. It may be as simple as that. So this is why we wanted to have the discussion because okay. we weren't, I, it's not in the context of fundraising, but it was more wanna, about- You might wanna go look at that. You might wanna go look at that. All I offer is go look at the one before because a lot of work was done to develop it. And it might be a source to probably have a okay. starting point and solve your problem. But hey, I just okay. offer it. If you don't want to do thank it, thank you. I, no, thank you. No, that's fine. No, it's helpful. All right. um, I think we're out of comments on that, Christina. If you want to move to the last item. Okie dokie. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, in, we've had a number of different policies. We're, we're trying, in addition to the crosswalk, we on policy governance have been trying to look at what CABE's recommended policies are um, for us to be adopting. Um, obviously, because there's not much happened over the course of the last year with COVID, um, there's been policy updates, and we've been trying, you know, we're trying, we're playing a little bit of catch up. Um, but one of the things that CABE has recommended is that boards adopt. Uh, these two policies uh, proposed 9327.1, which is board member use of social networks, et cetera, um, and a board civility code. So we've been looking at versions of these, certainly some since September, um, and we had time in our meeting finally this month um, to look at both of these and make some revisions to them, just clean up things, but basically staying with the CABE um document other than some kind of grammatical kind of or typo items um and any choice that had to be made when they give you an either or um and on tuesday the pgc um on a three zero votes on both of them uh recommend that the board adopt these so this is a first read on both of these policies um i'll just give you a little background additionally that um from the CABE policy highlights, they talk about um, civility codes and this behavior are good ground rules for communication among board members. Um, and these policies give directions to students, to our actions for students in the community. They're to promote a, a work and learning environment that's safe, productive, and nurturing for board members, students, and staff, which encourage the free flow of ideas um, without fear or intimidation students would be provided with appropriate models for respectful problem solving by these policies. Um, it's just kind of a, a very short statement from CABE about looking at adopting these. So this is a first read. So to the extent people have comments on them, um, we're welcome to hear them and PGC can go back and look at those comments. 
Um, otherwise, it's a first read and then the board would take it up at a later meeting. Ideally, you know, in at, at our next meeting since we have several weeks till then. Right. Both yes. of them are posted. Yeah. All right, Ms. Kowalski. Hey, Christina. So hey. I'm probably gonna have some some more questions, but I some of this stuff, I, I mean, I understand the general overarching theme for this, mm -hmm. but it, some of these things are, are very vague. So it leads to a, a broad interpretation and I wonder what that interpretation may be. So for example, if I'm looking at um, the oh, one on- Just use, go by number. If you could give us by number, it'll be sure, easier sure. So to follow up. Sure, sure. So 9327.1 in the second paragraph, it says board mm -hmm. members, personal use of social networking sites- whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. 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 It just, it's in oh. the second paragraph. It's the last. Okay. Sentence. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. It says it should be limited or prohibited because of the need to comply with Connecticut statutes pertaining to public records and open meetings as described in the Freedom of Information Act. So what does that mean? What Connecticut statutes and, and what use of sites is limited or prohibited because of those statutes? Is well, that explained uh... further? Right, if the whole point is to add clarity of what you can and cannot say in use of social networking, I, I and I want to make sure well, that like, I understand the interpretation, yeah, right? Sorry, I'm, I'll let you answer that question and then I can answer my next one. No, uh, my, my, I would have to talk to the people who came who did the initial draft, but I think because there are so many Connecticut statutes and they are constantly changing, um they may not have referred to all of them um that would be my guess but it's certainly something i can ask about okay the, the another question i had is the differentiating between personal use of a social networking versus your use say as 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 a board member so um the, is it that you need to make a statement prior to making any public statement on a social networking that I'm making this statement on behalf of Karen Kowalski as a human being and an individual and a resident of Greenwich, and then I can say whatever I want to say? Or is this saying, no, you've given up that ability to say certain things? So I'm just wondering where the- I think it's the, for I think it's the former, to be honest okay. with you. And I think, I mean, that's how I understand it. And, and I think you'll see like the RTM recently took up this matter, on, you know, similarly that, you know, when you say, you know, if you just sign something, Karen Kowalski is different than you saying, signing something saying Karen Kowalski board of ed member, right? Right. You, you know, that's the difference. When you, when you put your title on it, it creates a different perception. So it's not that you're, you're not able to say it, but you're, you're saying it with kind of this imprimatur of, of that it's coming from the board of education so that you know as opposed to like you know the rtm was talking about a disclaimer every time you say something right as i'm speaking as an individual and you know, only in my individual capacity well peter probably knows those very well i mean that oftentimes when lawyers get up and they're in you know cle classes and they have an opinion mm -hmm. on something and they say yes i'm you know this is karen kowalski this is my personal opinion and not my belief <laughs> as, as a lawyer <laughs> for act. um if the, if that's what this is intending i can you know i i can see that point i just the when i first my first read of this and which is you know why i wanted to make sure from, yeah. from a legal standpoint we were we were okay is that it just seemed like well wait a second i volunteered to do this job and i got elected and all of a sudden i gave up something <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the way in um and, and and granted i don't have so and i also don't have any social media networking sites i'm not on twitter i'm not on facebook i'm not on instagram only except to follow my daughter but other than that, I post nothing. There's not one single post. So uh, it really doesn't, that wasn't so much impacting me. It's just, where are we drawing the, the line? And I think I wanted to be clear here to make sure that one, we all understood what this meant. And, and you know, think if you look at it, and, and I think, you know, obviously we only posted it on Tuesday um, after our meeting. So it, it would give you another chance to go through and look at 
uh, at this one in particular. And I think this one is really very caution, a cautionary tale. It kind of says, be careful of, be cautious of, be aware of. And it's so that we don't inadvertently do something is also part of it. You know, don't create a meeting, um, you know, that kind of is also something to be aware of. Yeah, but so, I'm sure um, that don't don't create a meeting is somewhere else already in our policies because we all. But but you could put, you could inadvertently create a meeting on a face if you have you know oh, a I group of us saying. responding on a Facebook post together we've inadvertently created a meeting that's the you know right that's the kind of social networking danger to call it danger um, I I think is what the intent was but. If you want to read it again um, and yeah. contact me directly with any additional, you know, with line by line comments, I'm happy, or any of us on the committee are happy to discuss them. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? So this is a first read. It will come back, obviously, uh, as Christina and Karen were just talking about. You can email comments to Christina, and they'll take them up at PGC. Mr. Share. Um. Christina, it, it sounded to me from the description that this went kind of fast. You said on Tuesday and what have you did. Well, no, we only vote. We only voted on Tuesday. I see. OK, these have these have been discussed like since September. OK, so it's all in the minutes of your meetings, right? Yeah. So, it is. yeah. OK, so um, has but we it just been... we had to, we had not had an opportunity because we'd been bogged down in other tasks. So, yeah, that's... OK, for whatever reason, I know how committees go. Um, did this has this been the, through the review of the town attorney already what did they say it has been once we voted on it it's been submitted but it's also gone through the cabe council and has been vetted through their attorneys yeah but cabe's before not, it even before we even, our I, I, I totally agree but yeah, in terms so, of the, lega the legality has already before it even came to us Okay, so you guys have sent it off to the town attorney for, because you send all our yes. policies to the town attorney for review, right? They have to be. These are the first ones I'm doing as policy governance chair, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there um, you go. All right, so. Yeah, so I, I just, we have I, an, we have an they, answer they, they did not have enough time. No, when no, and this was only Tuesday. It's only two days. expect so, an answer back from them? I will check in with them. I told them sooner rather than later, but I did not expect, um, you know, a 24 hour turnaround on a non urgent matter. Yeah, so. I wouldn't expect that either. I think the important thing in, in here is there are, um, these are always a little bit, um, you know, these, these speech codes, these civility codes, these conduct codes, these always, these things are always. Uh, potentially problematic if they're not framed properly. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of them have been struck down because they restrict free speech. And, I, you know, I see here essentially controlling, you know, and I'm not, an, I'm not a lawyer. So, you know, um, you know, when you talk about restricting board members and their conduct in using social media, as independent people, I could see where this could, you know, I won't be on the board, so it won't really matter, but I could see where this could get the town of Greenwich in a lot of potential trouble. Mm -hmm. So I'd be looking really to hear from yeah. the town council, um, you know, what the, what the uh, exposure and, 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 and if there are particular clauses, um, that you're troubled by. Um, I'd like to hear, you know, obviously offline when you have a chance to look at them, we can have that conversation. Yeah. Or if you want to wait till they opine, that's fine too. Okay. So there's ample time. All right, seeing no other hands, uh, I believe we are done with our agenda. Mr. Kelly, did you have a motion you wanted to make? I do, but first I'd like to say I'm wearing my St. Patrick's Day tie <laughs> and happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Uh, we don't get to celebrate with our, our Greenwich St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, and this is the only chance to do it in, uh, in this crowd, so happy St. Patrick's Day uh, to everybody. I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second
I will second that motion. We'll take a uh, speed round. Bernstein, yes, Stowe. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day, Joe, is another Irish woman to an Irish man. <laughs> uh, yes. Hirsch. Yes. Downey. An Italian married to an Irishman. Yes. <laughs> Kelly. Yes. Kowalski. <laughs> <Kowalski. laughs> Kowalski. Uh, I'm Polish. My dad made me wear red on St. Patrick's Day, but yes. Ouch. Olson. Yes. And Cher. Yes. And I will just note that uh, St. Patrick's Day is my wife's birthday, so we are, uh, we're, we're big on the Irish over here. Good luck All right, Irish. with that, we are done. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you on the 25th. Good night. Good night. Good night.